There is nothing like the 1812 Overture. I hope you can hear it. <laughs> oh, this is going to be fun. Yeah, it is. Good morning, everybody. We're going to do Going in a Circle to launch on this 99K from 1954, and we are doing it to the 1812 Overture. Yeah, we are. Yeah, we are. <laughs> oh, this is fun. Getting ready, getting ready. There it is. I think we got it. I think we got it. I'm going to back this up a little bit. Give myself a little bit of room. Here we go. <laughs> All right, I'll stop there. I hope you could hear the music. I love the 1812 Overture. And it's so much fun to stitch around in a circle with that particular music. Look at that stitching, too. Absolutely, as it should be, absolutely spot on. And by way of introduction, I should tell you that this is the second machine that I've had an opportunity to prepare for uh, Lisa Sandig Sandigren out of the great state of Washington. And uh, I've told the tale a couple of times already. I've told the tale about her reaching out. Her initial interest is in this 99K. And if you didn't see it already, this is the 99K right here. She is a looker. She is a major, major looker. But beyond that, she's also a serious sewer and many of you don't know this about the 99Ks, about the uh, Spartans, which are also called a 192K. And uh, both of those machines have roots leading back to Scotland. They have roots leading back to Scotland, even though they're branded made in Great Britain. The machine's roots go back to great country of Scotland. So at any rate, this machine, the Spartan machines, in many cases, actually have bigger motors than the much bigger brothers within that Singer family of great machines, like the 201-2 and the, uh, the 1591. This particular 99K is actually equipped with a 0.7 amp motor, 0.7 amps which means it's actually a bigger motor than the 201-2 or the 1591. 0.7 amps versus 0.54 is what you're typically going to find on one of those potted Singer 
machines like the the 201-2, the 1591. So while it's only a three-quarter size machine, and that's why I refer to it as a mighty might, even though it's only a three-quarter size machine, it's going to have power that just blows your socks off. And while we didn't sew through crazy thick leather, this is saddle grade leather. And to the 1812 Overture, this little mighty mite buzzed around this saddle grade leather like it was a light cotton. No hesitation, no pause, no hand start, and lay down absolutely page 34 stitching. I'll try to get close to it with the camera if the camera will uh, help me out a little bit. Let me go over here a little bit. I did better this time. I almost made something that looks artistic. I didn't just sew in a circle. I was kind of kind of buzzing all over the place, wasn't I? It's was kind of fun. So that's obviously our top stitch. It's kind of a no-brainer, isn't it? And it's just gorgeous. And then look at our lock stitch on the back. And that's uh, the thing that I really like about this saddle grade leather is it doesn't have a real poofy um nap on the back so you can see the stitching straight away as you're looking at the uh, the leather and you can see that leather nap i mean they use saddle grade leather to make gun holsters to make saddle components and riding stuff for horses it is like the thick of thick even a single layer of this stuff is right around four ounces there we go. Now we're now the camera's like, hey, okay, I'm on duty. I'm on duty. And again, that's our lock stitch. I say it all the time. When it comes to quality stitching, even haphazardly put together machines can sneak out a decent looking top stitch. But when it comes to that lock stitch, it's a lot trickier process because that needle has to sweep down through the throat plate and it has to catch that thread to complete that lock stitch. And it has to pull that thread all the way back up through this saddle grade leather. And that is a tricky pop proposition. But you know what? I gave myself a little bit of an edge today knowing I wanted to launch into this live stream with the 1812 Overture. I gave myself a little bit of an edge. Our setup today is we're sewing with a Schmetz leather needle, a size 9014. There it is. We're sewing with a Schmetz leather needle, 9014, which will help us a lot since we're doing a little bit of a leather fest but it's not going to help us quite as much on some of the other materials that are non-leather. Like, I think we've got some denim set up. We've got some Kona cotton. We've got some other cotton. We've got just a variety of other materials that we're going to be stitching off. So we're going to have our leather needle to help us on the leather like this to lay down absolutely drop-dead gorgeous stitching like you're seeing right there. And again... This is an easy peasy sew off. Look at that from the side. Saddle grade leather, if, you, if you've not done a lot of leather sewing, saddle grade leather is one of the toughest ones to get through, even tougher than genuine cowhide. And so when it comes to stitching something like this with a three quarter size 99K, three-quarter size 99K. <clears throat> if you look at the body of this machine and you compare it to, say, a 201-2 or a lot of the other singers, the Class 66, we're a good three to four inches shorter in overall bed length. It's a real compact machine. And yet, surprisingly, when you look at the harp opening here, from the bed to the bottom of the arm, from the needle to the pillar, 
these machines will absolutely blow your mind in the ability to rotate bulkier materials. I've got some customers that use 99Ks for quilting, not just piecing blocks together, but they actually use these machines for quilting. And part of it is the portability of this machine with it only being three quarter size, it's easy to move a machine like this around. It's easy to tote it around to a quilting retreat or to a, a quilting expo or something like that. If you have a little business and you want to demonstrate some of your stuff in front of a little audience at a quilting uh, expo, this machine is a lot easier to haul around than a full size, uh, say a class 66, a 201 dash two, or a lot of the other singer models. So that's one of the other great things about this. And again, the really cool thing about this machine is not only does it stitch beautifully, but with that 0.7 amp motor, again, a bigger motor than the 201-2 or the 1591 come with, it's also got the power for some crazy heavy duty sewing as well. And we'll be doing some of that on this live stream. Whenever, whenever I'm getting ready to send a machine off, and graduate it from the workshop. Uh, I'm not gonna do window dressing. I'm gonna do some serious sewing. Anyway, let me throw this to the side. And if you're just joining the live stream late, um, we you have to you have to rewind. We did this to the 1812 overture, and hopefully the music. I know that YouTube uses some sort of a sound canceling type feature, which is really annoying. I've got a ask you guys if you want to google around or do some research and find out if there's a way to to bypass that sound muting thing that it does it'll have a sound that is steady coming in then it kind of it kind of muffles it which is really frustrating when you want to listen to a great song uh, a great uh, tune like the 1812 overture but hopefully you're able to hear part of it anyway and enjoy this incredible sew off that we did as a launch It'll eventually focus. It will. <laughs> there it is. That'll eventually focus in on. And uh, again, look at that, what we sewed through. Again, with a three-quarter size machine, a little mighty might. All right, enough blah, blah, blah. Let me throw that to the side. <clears throat> I'll put it right back here. And I'll just show you some of the off-camera sew-offs I did as well. Um, this over here is a uh, protected full grain leather. And uh, I kind of started, let me put it in the correct direction. I kind of started over here. Like I've said before, when I take a machine like this through about 130 steps, I don't do a single sew off unless the customer has a specific complaint about a machine. I don't do a single sew off until I'm done with my entire process. There I am. Until I'm done with my entire process. And so when I'm starting to stitch it off and I'm making adjustments and getting that balanced, uh, you can see here we have a real weak, <clears throat> we have a real weak uh, top stitch starting out over on this side. I think you can see that. Hopefully you can see that. So we start out with a real weak uh, top stitch over on this side. And then gradually as I go across, and I'm making adjustments on the bobbin case. I'm making adjustments on the upper tension. It slowly starts to come into form. And then all of a sudden we get to this row right here. And we've hit that sweet spot, haven't we? We've hit that sweet spot where the, the machine is incredibly happy. And then I also take the stitch length way down to see if I can maintain that stitch uh, integrity, that stitch presentation. And we get all the way down to about 15 to 20 stitches per inch. But you can see when a machine is, is finished, and again, whenever I service a machine, I, I don't just wipe through the discs on the upper tension. I tear this completely down. You, you can see that in the progress shots. Uh, I'm not going to show them to you today, but what I'm going to do, and I really want you to do this, is I want you to, after this live stream is done, eventually go back and look at the description for this live stream. There's always a description area with any uh, video. And I'll have all the links there of all the progress shots of what I took this 99K through. 
and you'll see you, you couldn't see it from the outside but you'll see that there was rust there was uh marring on the discs and everything else that would have created a lot of problems for lisa with uh catching thread breaking thread and also throwing that tension balance way off and so when you go through a a process like mine on a machine like this, uh, every aspect of that machine is touched all the way from bobbin to the balance wheel. And uh, it makes every dense difference in the world as far as what that machine is able to do, how it performs, and ultimately the biggest deal, the stitch quality. Because it doesn't matter how pretty a machine looks if it doesn't lay down page 34 stitching. I think you would agree. So we've got to get that stitch absolutely spot on. And then I focus on some of the other things on the machine. I focus a little bit on the, the jewelry over here of this beautiful badge mark that started really grungy. And on the class plate, do any of you remember, I've mentioned this before, when did singers start adding class plates like this to their machines? What year was that? And if you get it in the, the chat first and, and nail it uh, and reach out after the live stream, I'll send you something special. So tell me what year they started doing this, this extra little plate that has the class of the machine on it. And also, the obviously, with the K, it has the manufacturing location as well. The letter after the numbers is always going to tell you where that machine was made. The only tricky thing, again, about this model is that the 99K was not really made in the United Kingdom, in Great Britain. It was actually made in Scotland. And the, the telltale clue of that is when you look at a serial plate and it starts with an E series like this, the E series is always a telltale sign that that machine was manufactured over in Scotland. So I joked around in another premiere live stream about... You know, Great Britain and those folks can take try to take credit for machines like this, but in in fact, this machine is a Scottish machine. So I wish I could do a Scottish accent, but I'm not really good at the Scottish accent, and it makes Hank bark when I do it too. So, but did anyone nail that? Let me look at the chat real quick as you folks are gathering, and I can also say good morning to you as well. Oh, and also look at this uh, genuine elk hide that I sewed off off camera as well and uh i'll be i'll be doing more elk hide today during this premiere so all right who do we have so we've got emma good morning emma and we have we have renee welcome renee and we have helen spencer i don't think i've seen helen before but again i when i'm doing a live stream i can't I can't participate in the, the live chat as much. So Helen may have been here before, but the, the name looks new to me. But it's so great to have Helen here. And kudos to anyone that is courageous enough to jump out of the shadows and step into the light and become part of the live chat so you can make new friendships and you can meet folks. I think that's so cool. Who else do we have? So I, I greeted everybody that's in the live chat right now. I greeted everybody. Yay. Okay. Emma, one of our leaders, wrote down 1953. And guess what, Emma? You're absolutely right. And the easiest way to remember that date is they started adding these plates. They started adding these plates. Oh, good morning, David. I wanted to show you this uh, genuine elk hide as well. Once the camera decides to focus, maybe if I put it up here, it'll be happier. I don't know. Let me do it like this. Trying to get my camera to focus. It'll focus eventually. 
Oh, come on, camera. Ugh. There we go. We kind of have it focused now. Come on. Okay, I'm trying my best to show you. And then if you look at it from the side with this elk hide, you're looking at right around four to five ounces of leather. I've seen men's and ladies belts that are considered heavier grade that are not as thick as this uh, genuine elk hide. And again, this little mighty mite went through it with no effort whatsoever. And look at that lock stitch on the back. I'll eventually get this camera to cooperate. It's it's being naughty right now. There we go. Kind of got it. Ah. There we go. Oh, now it's real happy. Look at that. Holy mackerel. It all of a sudden said, okay, I'm not going to give Scott a hard time anymore. I'm not going to focus in. But my point is this. This is genuine elk hide. It's chemically processed. And I've seen posted in different places where folks will say that a little machine like the 99K or even the Spartan, which even has a little bit bigger motor than this particular 99K, the Spartan typically comes with a 0.8 amp motor, which makes it two times more powerful than the Singer Featherweight. All right, well, you guys get the idea. I won't, I won't drive you nuts anymore in trying to get this camera to focus on this stuff and be good. But needless to say, a three-quarter size machine like this, whether it's saddle grade leather like I did at the opening or this genuine elk hide or this protected full grain leather, a three-quarter size machine <clears throat> is able to get the job done very, very easily if it's running uh, at the top of its game. Now, the one thing you might notice if you're new to this channel is what's up with these little pads? that you have you got one right there you've got one right back over here as well on the back of the machine well the 99k and the spartan and the 185k and the 185j that came out of canada they don't sit level they don't sit level on a surface if i didn't have these leveled out with these little furniture slide pads one here under this pedestal foot and in another one right around the back, uh, this machine would be sitting cockeyed. It'd be sitting kind of tilted over and it would be really unstable. It'd be real wobbly. So I level it out with these furniture pads so that it need not be in uh, a base or a table. Uh, you can simply level it out like this and use it right on your kitchen table or use it anywhere you want. And then I add one, one more little piece right over here. You can kind of see underneath there sort of can see let me kind of come like this i put a little non-skid pad underneath this part of the machine because as the machine is working i'll just rotate it a little bit you can see that this is moving back and forth very rapidly and so this would have a this little uh point right here would have a tendency to skip or to slide around a little bit so by putting that little non-skid pad underneath there it gives this also a good stable, non-sliding type surface. So between this and that, and this over here, we're able to get away with operating this machine through a wide scope of sew-offs that you're gonna see in this live stream today 
and the machine will be very, very stable. It's not going to be wobbling around. It's not going to be wiggling. It's not going to be jiggling. It's going to just get its job done like it's supposed to, which is great, right? Okay. So let me take a look real quick at the live stream again to see if there's anyone that I, anyone else I want to say hello to. And then we're going to launch into the next sew-off. And I'm going to let you guys pick some of these sew-offs too. Oh, that, that's my little light right there. I'm going to shut it off. There we go. Okay. Who else? Oh, welcome. Welcome to Laurel. I don't recognize the name of Laurel either, so it's great to have Laurel here. I've already said good morning to Helen and to Emma and to Renee and to David. Good morning to David as well. Just seeing if there's anybody else that I missed. I don't want to miss anybody, but I know this. I know that Emma and or Paula, Sonny, and Bill will take real good care of our friends that come to join these live streams, which is awesome. Okay, I think I greeted everybody. I think so. So I'm going to give myself a smiley face for doing a good job. Let me see if I can do that. Oops, what did I do? I clicked the wrong thing. Ah! All right. I just gave myself a smiley face for greeting everybody. Yeah. It's the little things that matter, right? <laughs> oh, and hello to Terry as well. Terry just popped up. At least I think, I think Terry just popped up and I wanted to greet her as well. Cool. I love it. I love seeing all these new, these new VSM students slash fellow teachers showing up at the live streams and at the premieres. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, my whole philosophy on live streams like this, where I show you great machines like this 1954 uh, Singer 99K, my whole philosophy on live streams like this on premieres is that we learn together. None of us have all the answers. And we're sometimes a teacher, but we're always a student. And I think that's something that people love about the culture of this channel is I'm not a know-it-all. I don't have all the answers. I've been doing this a long time, but I'm still learning. And I learn from all of you also. I learn from all of you. So let's do some more sewing on this 99K and be amazed at how a three-quarter size machine is able to uh, just dazzle you with its heavy-duty uh, capabilities with heavy duty capabilities. And this is, let me explain real quick. This is uh, original uh, paint. This is, these are the original decals. And this machine came out of my personal collection. So when Lisa reached out and she said, I've been watching a bunch of your videos on the 99s, the 99Ks on the Spartans. And I really think I want to get a 99K. I then, when it went to my personal collection, which is topping about 200 machines, and I went through my 99s, my 99Ks, and I selected this one, presented it to her, and she says, I love it, it's perfect, and uh, that's what I want to go with. So that's kind of my process. I get asked all the time, you know, people will reach out from all around the world, very much like our friend Heidi did from Switzerland over a year ago or so. Remember Heidi? Heidi reached out from Switzerland and said, I'm going to be taking a class in the Swiss Alps on how to make custom shoes. I'm not making this up. You could go back and listen to her interview under the playlist of VIP interviews. She's such a sweet gal. And she reached out from Switzerland and she said, I want you to give me a machine that will help me with my shoemaking because your machines are the best. This is a lady from Switzerland, and I'm just a little guy in Wisconsin. But you know what? I really do try to improve my processes all the time, and I try to make the machines better than when they left the factory. And apparently she understood that. But my point is this. 
that when folks reach out, I don't have uh, an eBay channel or something like that where I list all of my machines for sale. They're sitting in my personal collection, and then I'll pull them out like this one and like the 201-2 that Lisa already has that I, that I finished, I premiered, and then I shipped it to her in Washington State. That's how I operate. So after watching this, if you go, gosh, I would love to have a Mighty Might with, you know, a bigger motor, you know, than even the 201-2 or the 1591 and be able to sew leather like this with absolute ease, saddle grade leather, protected full green leather, genuine elk hide, you know, that's crazy thick and just buzz through it. Um, you know, just reach out and I'll, 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 I'll see if I can find the, you know, the, the appropriate machine, uh, in my personal collection. And here's the big deal about my personal collection. And I won't harp on this very long because it sounds a little bit self-serving. And, and this is about Lisa today and her incredible 99 K that I had the honor to prepare for her. It's not about Scott, but I, I need to tell you this, that 99.9% of my machines, almost like the sanitizer stuff that we became so well acquainted with during the pandemic, it kills 99%, 99.9% of germs. 99.9% .9 of the machines in my personal collection, like this 99K and like the 201 2 that I already finished, premiered, and shipped to Lisa out in Washington State, are original owner machines. That means that I can, I can go back to the original owner that bought that machine, and I either bought that machine like this directly from that original owner or from an immediate family member, it's always been in that family. It hasn't been tossed around. It hasn't gone through an estate sale. It hasn't been at goodwill.com. It hasn't been at some remote thrift shop or antique shop. And you have no idea who's had that machine, how they've handled it, how they've maintained it. With 99.9% .9 of, of my machines, and I'll tell you if, if, if it's not an original owner machine, but an original owner machine, it's so cool because you know where that machine has been. You know who's had it. You know that that original owner making an investment in a machine like this, even back in 1954, very few folks, unless they were very wealthy, affluent people, very few people could afford to buy a machine outright. They just couldn't do it. It was too much money coming out of the monthly budget, especially if they had kids or other expenses. So the majority of machines that would have been bought back in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and even the 50s would have been bought on an installment program where they would sometimes take up to two years to pay off that machine. And they would make monthly installment payments on it every single month until that machine was paid off in full. And if you guys remember the, the gentleman, he's also a person that I interviewed and he's under that playlist of VIP people that I've interviewed. You can go to the Cow Country channel, look for that playlist that says VIP interviews or something like that. And I interviewed this gentleman who's from the East Coast. He worked for Singer and he ran a Singer store like you guys have seen uh, in archive photos, photos, those really cool singer stores that they had that were dedicated just to singer back in the day. And then eventually he opened his own store, but he said, Scott, you have no idea how difficult it was back then, how tight money was and how many machines people would buy on installments like a 99K like this. And something would come up. Someone would get sick. Someone would lose their job or something else catastrophic would happen and they couldn't make their installment payments and we would have to repossess that sewing machine. We would have to take it back. And he said they had a pile of these machines in that singer shop that they would send people out and they would take that machine back if the person couldn't pay for it. Now, let me ask you a question. If you make a big enough investment back in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, or 60s, where you're actually paying installments on something like this, are you going to take care of that machine? Are your family members who saw you, you know, basically pinching pennies to try to pay that machine off so it wasn't repossessed? Are you going to take care of that machine? Are you going to oil it? Are you going to maintain it? Are you going to take great care of it? You're doggone right you will. 
because it's a major investment. And that's the big deal about a, an original owner machine is this came from a family where that original owner was pinching pennies so that out of their very limited budget, they could eventually pay off this machine and be able to say, I own it now. I own it. So that's why I go with, I get contacted all the time from people about, I've got a machine for sale or my grandmother passed away or my mom passed away or some other horrible event like that has happened. And even though it's a little bit awkward because they're still sometimes grieving, I'll take them through a battery of questions about that machine. And sometimes that conversation will end with me saying, I am so sorry for your loss. I'm so sorry, but it sounds like your mom or your grandmother got that machine, you know, secondhand, or she got it from some other person that had it before. And another person had it before that. And I will turn those machines down. I've done it countless times because providence and knowing the roots of that machine is so important to me and to most of my customers as well. It certainly was important to Lisa to know that this machine came from the original owner and I was the second owner. And now she will be the permanent owner of this 99 K along with the 201 dash two. So anyway, blah, 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 blah. You guys are so patient. Let's go back to sewing on this machine. I'll get a little bit more music on maybe, and we'll check this machine out. First of all, I just have to do a little bit of wipe off on the bed. So I think I did this before, but if someone wants to look up this machine and post in the chat, what, oh, hi, Kevin and Doreen. I'm just looking at the chat real quick before I do the next sew off. Good morning, Kevin and Doreen. And I don't know if anyone else has joined and I'm missing them. Let's just take a look. Oh, how cool. I see that. Um, oh, I, I did miss a person. I just scrolled up. Um, if I'm saying the name correctly, and, and if I'm not, please forgive me, Jindra or Jendra. Jendra is, has also joined the live chat as well, which is wonderful. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to all of our new folks. It's so cool to have you here. And I think I said good morning to Laurel already. I'm 99% I'm sure I did. All right. I'm going to get back to work, and we're going to do some more sewing on this great 1954 Singer uh, 99K. And if you want to look up the birth date and the production group size, we did this the other day when we announced our contest. And if you don't know about our contest, here's the serial number. If you don't know about our contest, our contest is because we hit 12,000 subscribers on this YouTube channel. And uh, I'm doing a giveaway. And... It's a fun creative writing contest. So you'll want to check that out. There's a, a live stream that we just did on that. And there's also um, a post on Facebook if you do Facebook. So if you're able to see this, I hope you're able to see that uh, serial number. Um, let me turn the light on as well, see if that helps. There we go. There it is. There it is. Yay. Finally. <laughs> So there's a serial number. If you want to look it up and post in the chat, uh, the date of birth and the production group size for this machine, that would be great. And uh, the uh, the serial number, again, is E, uh, E as in Edward, J as in Juliet, 705-519. 519, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Okay. from right there. I don't want to get too close. Okay, there we go. Got it. Got it, got it, got it.
Just give me a second. <coughs> Excuse me. Just give me a second. I'm just trying to pick out a, a little song to put on. Okay, thanks for your patience. <clears throat> All right. What are we going to sew next? What are we going to sew next? Here we go. So I've got a variety of sew-offs that we can do. <clears throat> I've got everything from... Whoops, I just dropped something. I've got saddle grade leather, or I've, excuse me, I've got uh, genuine elk hide. Quite a bit of that, actually. I've got vegetable tan leather. I've got more saddle grade leather. Protected full grain leather, the blue stuff. Italian leather. Gosh, I got a lot of Italian leather. And then finally, this is uh, cow hide, genuine cow hide. What else? Oh, I've got, let me, let me move the leathers into one pile. And then for non-leather stuff, non-leather stuff, I've got this commercial upholstery material. I've got this bubblegum material. And if you're brand new and you go, why do you call it bubblegum material? Well, kind of see it, right? Yeah. This is real tricky stuff because it has a high concentration of vinyl in it. And then I've got uh, some canvas, canvas right here. I've got denim. I've got more of a standard 100% cotton. And then I have Paula Noel's Kona cotton with a little bit of quilt batting, quilt batting in between. So what do you guys think? What do you want to see me sew next? We can sew any of this stuff. Or we can continue to sew leather. I'll let you guys make the choice, and then we'll jump into it. <clears throat> so Emma saying she wants to see Italian leather. Cool. All right, we'll do Italian leather next. Okay, Italian leather, Italian leather. I love leathers, I really do. And some of you that are, are regulars at these know that I get my leather in little scraps and remnants from a local business that they're, they basically make uh, seats and uh, you know coverings inside of the real fancy uh, Lear jets and the private jets and stuff. And then the scraps that they don't need, they bag them up, and then I'm able to buy those bags uh, of leather. And that's how I get all my, my leather stuff. So kind of cool. All right, let me set this to the side. And I think what we'll do is, if it's okay, is we won't even bother with a single layer. Single layer is kind of insulting to this, uh, this 99K with a 0.7 amp motor. We're going to launch right into two layers of this Italian leather. Two layers is probably around five or six ounces of leather. And if the ounce thing doesn't make any sense to you, uh, like it didn't make to me either in the beginning, uh, we're looking at probably a thickness right here, of about three millimeters of leather, approximately three millimeters of leather. And what we're going to do is we're going to kind of sew down and around and again, we've got a little bit of an edge today. We've got a little bit of an edge because I've got a leather needle in here today. I usually go with a universal, but today I've got a leather needle in there. It's it's a Schmetz size 9014 universal needle. I showed it to you guys at the beginning of the live stream, but if, if you weren't here, this is the needle we're using today. 
And I have a real strong bias when it comes to Schmetz. I think Schmetz make the finest needles in the world. Certainly, there's other great uh, needle manufacturers out there like Organ. And uh, but I, I'll be honest with you, if if I was in the middle of a project or getting ready for a live stream, and somehow I ran out of needles, and I went to a local retailer, and all they had was the newer style Singer needles, I would be postponing that live stream, or I would be postponing that premiere because the new Singer needles, the manufacturing quality of them is incredibly poor, incredibly poor. Um, I've tried them and they're just awful, but the Schmetz and the organ needle manufacturers, they do a spectacular job when it comes to quality control. So I strongly recommend Schmetz. And I know my good friend, Alex Askaroff over in the UK also loves Schmetz as well. He shared that when we interviewed him. And if you didn't see that interview that I did with Alex uh, over in the UK, that's also under that playlist of VIP interviews. He's a fascinating guy. I really have gotten to know uh, both he and his wife, Yana. What a beautiful name, isn't it? Yana. I've gotten to know them quite well. I've gotten to know a little bit about their family. And so uh, isn't that the wonder of our space, our VSM space? The wonder of our VSM space is we can make new friends with folks uh, from around the world. And we can we can celebrate those new friendships, uh, even in live streams like this. We've gotten to know a number of international people uh, through these live streams, like Dr. T over in Finland and Christina uh, over in Brazil. And the list goes on. Robert in uh, Hamburg, Germany. These are regular people that join our live streams. So if you're still in the shadows right now, I totally respect that. But if you feel courageous, if you feel wild, if you feel like, ah, then step out of the shadows like all these other folks in the live chat right now and make yourself known. Tell us where you're from if, if you if you wouldn't mind. And because it, it's just cool to meet new folks, isn't it? I can't tell you how many friendships have been forged through live streams like this. Truly, truly. It's really cool. All right, blah, 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 blah. All right. <clears throat> oh, welcome to Delilah. I just happened to glance over. Welcome to Delilah. How great to have, how great to have new folks joining us, isn't it? What a blessing. What a wonderful blessing. All right. So two layers of Italian leather uh, at Emma's request. And uh, we're going to go ahead and stitch down this now. And I'm going to try to do it. I'm going to try to do it without a hand start. But here's the only thing about the 99Ks, the 99s, the Spartans, is they're belt driven. They're belt driven. And whenever you have that output pulley on a motor and it has a long belt, like the featherweight, if you didn't know this, the featherweight belt is one of the longest belts on any Singer sewing machine. And the transfer from that output pulley, which is the little pulley that the belt rides on off of the motor, the, the, the belt running over that pulley and then coming up over the balance wheel and then going down the main shaft and everything, you lose so much energy doing that. And so I'm going to try to do this without uh, a hand start. But if it stalls, I'm going to go ahead and hand start it just so you know. Okay. All right. So here we go. Two layers of Italian leather, and we'll see how this 99K manages this sew-off. It's not going to be easy. All right, here we go. Keep your fingers and toes crossed, and keep your seatbelt on until the ride comes to a complete stop. Yeah, all of that. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Oh, look at that. I even ended in the down position. That seldom if ever happens. Ever. All right. So I'm going to raise my presser foot. I'm going to make my little turn. All right. And that was without a hand start, folks. How cool is that? And again, that goes back to this machine right now. Nothing is holding it back. Nothing is holding it back. So it's just rocking and rolling. Here we go. All right. Now I'm going to go down to the finish. Press your foot back down. There we go. I'm going to clip my little threads real quick just so I've got them clipped.
I want you to be able to see that straight away. That stitching, it's absolutely spot on. All right, let's go down to the finish. Complete silence in the workshop except for my little heater. And uh, listen to this machine run. It's just silky smooth. It's crazy silky smooth. I love this 99K. Oh, did you see that little stall? I didn't have the leather all the way underneath the presser foot. And so almost like in Wisconsin, when the roads get slippery, we started to slip a little bit. And then finally those feed dogs were able to grab it and said, okay, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to make this happen. But at the end of this stitch line right over here, we're probably going to see something a little bit weird uh, because of that little skid that we just did. All right, here we go. All right, I'm going to close the box. I usually don't do this, but I'm going to close the box to help out our box closers. We have some folks that will send me nasty notes about, why didn't you close the box? Why didn't you close the box? So we're going to do that today. All right, here we go. All right, let's take a look at this stitching. I can already see it. And it's like, are you kidding me? What? All right, let me back this camera up just a little bit. Get ourselves all set for the next sew -off. And just a quick little tip, and I share this regularly, because I get contacted by folks that they're having trouble with the machine stalling or it binds or something like that when they launch. And typically it's because their take-up arm, when they're launching, is way at the low position here. See where it is right now, this take-up arm? Whenever you launch with a sew-off, whether it's sewing heavier stuff like this Italian leather right here, aren't those gorgeous stitches? Oh, my gosh. Look at those. Whether you're sewing two layers of Italian leather like this, which I would consider to be a heavy-duty sew-off, or whether you're sewing something a lot lighter, you always want to start with that take-up arm at the highest position. Start with that take-up arm at the very highest position and really at the point where it's getting ready to go on its down sweep. Watch that take-up arm. See how it's starting to swing down? See that? That is the perfect spot to launch for any sewing. If you've had trouble with the thread kind of uh, bunching up on the bottom, we obviously didn't have that trouble here. It's beautiful. This is our lock stitch. We didn't have any trouble with that at all on the bottom. Or if you've had trouble with the machine just kind of locking up and it doesn't it doesn't launch properly, that's that's going to be a product typically because the take up arm is at a lower position at, at the top. And what's the big deal there? The big deal is when the take up arm is at the top, all of the mechanics of that machine are prepared to then rotate those moving parts in a downward fashion to complete that sewing cycle. So it gets the job done beautifully. Whereas when you're kind of on that up sweep and that take-up arm is at a lower position, it's not gonna be launching properly. It's not gonna be launching. It's gonna, it's gonna lock up, it's gonna bind, and you're gonna get all kinds of weird stuff happening, which could include bird nesting on the bottom of the material. So, if you want beautiful stitching like this right now, kind of go up and down with a little bit. Oh, and I mentioned Christina, and I'm just glancing over at the computer real quick. Christina has joined us from Brazil. If you see the name Christina in the live chat, that's our friend from Brazil. She's a beautiful person, very, very kind. And if, if I do, if I have the time, I'll chat with her in Portuguese, which is her language. Uh, and if I'm not available, then uh, Emma will do that usually. All right. I'm not going to belabor it. These are absolutely page 34 stitches. They're absolutely gorgeous. And then if we look at that lock stitch on the back, there's, there's no difference whatsoever. And that's really the big deal is You've got to get that stitch quality, not only on the top stitch, which is always easier to do, you've got to do it on the lock stitch as well. 
Whoops, I got too close. Sorry. I just turn my little light on, see if that helps. Yeah, it does a little bit. So this is a definite pass. Again, we went through this much leather. It's Italian leather, probably about five or six ounces of leather. We laid down page 34. I'm just verifying. We laid down page 34 top stitching. We laid down page 34 lock stitching as well. So I'm going to throw this to the back with our little mounting leather fest over here. We've already on this live stream, we opened up with the 1812 Ultra, which is such a cool instrumental piece, right? We sewed this, um, this saddle grade leather, about three to four ounces of that. Off camera, I did this protected full grain leather as I was getting all of the adjustments done on the machine, along with this, sat, uh, this uh, genuine elk hide as well. And then just now we did this, these two layers of Italian leather about five to six ounces of leather. And again, Lisa's machine just laid down stitching that in my opinion, where is it? There it is. Absolutely brag worthy. Absolutely brag worthy. So I'm going to throw that in the pile as well back there. There it goes. There it goes. There it goes. This is the beginning of what I call our sew off sandwich. And it's all part of our sewing Olympics. When I'm getting ready to send a machine to an owner, I don't just take it through one or two sew-offs. I take it through a whole litany of sew-offs to make sure that that machine is ready. All right. So what are we going to sew next? If anyone wants to chime in, we have um, non-leather stuff as well. I'll just kind of show you over here. We've got uh, this Kona Cotton with uh, quilt batting in between. It's really cool stuff. So we got the Kona cotton. We've got 100% um, cotton with kind of a stiffener in between as well. You can kind of see that. This is 100% uh, cotton. Both of these are 100% cotton, the Kona cotton, and then also this other quilt, uh, cotton that I got from a fat quarter. We've got... Um, this heavy grade denim as well that we could sew next. We've got canvas of various thicknesses. We've got bubble gum material, which again, if you join the live stream a little bit late, I call it bubble gum material because of this factor right here with all of the vinyl in it. It's crazy as far as the vinyl. And then finally, last but not least, commercial grade upholstery material. So out of any of these sew-offs, we can kind of move into a non-leather sew-off, at least for a moment. What Which of these would you like to see? I'm going to look at the chat, whether it's the cotton, the denim, the canvas, the bubblegum material, or the commercial upholstery material. You pick, and we will sew it on Lisa's uh, 99K from 1954. <clears throat> Uh, Emma is saying, welcome, Kara. So welcome to Kara. I hope I'm saying that name correctly. And again, again, uh, welcome to Christina from Brazil. Um, and as you see, Emma trying to basically be the United Nations. Emma will read uh, Christina's message in Portuguese. Then she will translate it to English. And she'll let you know what Christina said. And then she will send the message back to Christina in Portuguese. I mean, this is nuts, isn't it? But it's so much fun. And it's so great to have Emma and the other leaders to help me. Because how, how could I possibly do this and also be translating messages in Portuguese? It's just, it's just not possible. Well, it's not, it's not probable. It's not likely. All right. So... You know what? I told you guys about the setup on this machine already. Um, we've got, as far as a needle, we've got a, a 9014 Schmetz leather needle in here today. 
Now, the difference between a universal and a leather needle is going to really be on the end of the needle nearest to the point. The leather needle is going to have a almost like a serrated cutting edge to it on the leather needle. And the uh, the scarf on it, the 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 shaft on it is also going to be more compatible for piercing through heavy leather like you've already seen us do. The Schmetz Universal Needle is going to have a different point and a slightly different scarf that will make it more accommodating to a wide field of sew-offs. So as you're looking at needles, it's important to understand that, that <clears throat> the Universal Needle is going to give you a lot of flexibility in choosing a wide field of materials to sew. But if you have a small business and all you work with is leather, then it really does behoove you to have a leather needle in that machine. And always, I recommend Schmetz uh, because it's going to give you that serrated cutting edge down near the point that's going to just beautifully slice through that leather and give you a beautiful finished stitch product. And most people that are sewing with leather, they're going to be selling a product where the stitch quality is absolutely essential. It's got to be perfect. And so, you know, choose your needles carefully. And if you want to go to a great site, um, I've got it in the about part on the Cow Country page where that particular link will take you to this company. They specialize in every thread that you can imagine. Uh, believe it or not, they even sell in bombing thread. Not that we need that or, 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 or require it in any way, but they have every thread under the sun from surgical stuff to sewing stuff. And then they also have a wide field of needles to pick from as well, along with threads, other types of threads as well that are specialty type threads. So, you know, our setup, our setup is important, uh, you know, for success, but I sometimes will intentionally push the boundaries because I want to highlight the fact that the machine is able to make up for the deficit of the setup that I've given it. So today we've got a leather needle, which is helping us a lot on leather. But when we, when we move into some of the other materials, it may not help us as much. It may actually inhibit us a little bit. It may hold us back a little bit, but the machine is going to make up for that. And I didn't tell you guys, but the thread we're working with today, if you can see it in the shot, is a dual duty by Coates and Clark. And it's kind of a, it's one of these threads that, it can be used for just a wide, almost like a universal needle. It can be used for a wide variety of sewing applications. I even have some quilters that will use, there it is. I'll even have some quilters that will use a uh, dual duty thread uh, in their quilting as well. There you go. Now you can finally see it. And a dual duty thread like this is going to be right around the 40 the 40 weight range. Threads are rated in a number of different ways, but one of the key factors with thread is weight. In other words, how heavy is that thread going to be? Uh, how What kind of needle do I need to use with that thread? 40 weight is pretty standard. They certainly make lighter threads in this as well in the 30 weight range. Those are going to be typically the Coates and Clark. Uh, they call it all-purpose type threads. Matter of fact, I might have an example of that up here. Give me a second. Where is it? Yep, I do. So here's a Coates and Clark all-purpose type thread. And you can pick this up at major retailers like Joanne Fabrics. You can pick it up at uh, Walmart and other places like that. This is going to be closer to the 30 weight range. It's going to be a little bit lighter of a thread. So depending on uh, I talk about this a lot when I'm setting up a machine like this and I tear apart this upper tension, there's a number of calibration steps that I have to go through. And one of those calibration steps is this take up spring right here. See that moving? And that's going to be moving rapidly during the sewing process. You, if you ever look at your machine, this sucker is going up and down, up and down. The return on this should be right around five ounces if when when someone let's say they get really ambitious and they tear apart an upper tension like this and they over calibrate this take up spring where it has too much return on it and then you use a lighter thread like this around a 30 weight thread 
and I'll get contacted by them and they say, I clean my upper tension. I've done everything that I know to do, but this thread that I'm using keeps breaking. And I'll say, how did you calibrate your take-up spring? When you push on it, how much resistance are you getting? How much resistance are you getting when you push on this? And they say, it's, it's pretty hard to move. It's real stiff. I said, you need to take apart your upper tension again then and recalibrate this take-up spring so that its return is, you know, you have to push it with some resistance, but it's going to move more freely. And that's where, you guys remember me showing you recently one of the uh, Husqvarna sewing machines, and I showed you that upper tension. I showed you how to take it apart. I showed you how to clean it on that, uh, I think it was off of a Class 21 Husqvarna. I took it all the way down. I cleaned it. I put it all the way back together. And I explained that little plastic tab on the bottom. Remember that? That little plastic tab on the upper tension for the Husqvarna. That little plastic tab controls the return of that take-up spring on that Husqvarna upper tension. We don't have that luxury on the Singer. So we have to do it ourselves if we decide to tear that upper tension apart and calibrate this return so that it's a lighter return. Otherwise... If it's a heavier return, you got to go with a heavier thread than this, because otherwise that thread, as you sew, especially if you're sewing multiple layers of whatever, it's going to have a tendency to break and break and break and break and break and break. And you're going to get really frustrated. Kind of like you guys remember when I did that premiere live stream, I did that premiere live stream and I was sewing with this stuff. Where is it? It's up here in my little thing. From a light on. Nope, that's the wrong one. That's not in there. Nope. Oh, yeah, that is it. That is, I think that's it. Yep, that's it. That's it. There it is. You guys remember when I did that premiere on a machine and I was sewing with this gorgeous, absolutely drop dead gorgeous. I mean, there's so many colors within this sulky brand, but this 100% rayon. Get real close so you can see it. Let me shut my light off. There we go. Let me set it down. Maybe that'll make it easier. This 100% rayon stuff. Let me hold the camera still. Come on, focus. Focus, focus, focus. There we go. Now we got it. Hey, this 100% rayon thread by Sulky. Gorgeous thread, beautiful colors, crazy beautiful colors. But this stuff is rated at a 40 weight. It's rated at a 40 weight. But when you sew with this stuff, it's like you're sewing with super lightweight thread. It has a great tendency to break. Uh, all the time. And that 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 breaking factor with this 100% rayon thread, and this stuff I picked up at Joanne Fabrics because I thought it was just gorgeous. But with stuff like this, you really have, if you're going to be sewing with this stuff all the time because it's gorgeous thread, you're going to have to really, really calibrate this take-up spring way down. So the return on that is going to be probably about two to three ounces of return. In other words, you can push it and it's just blah, 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 really, really easy. Because otherwise, when, when you're working with something like this, you're going to be breaking this stuff left and right all the time. You just are. So if you decide to sew with rayon thread, keep that in mind. You're going to have to adjust your upper tension way down as that rayon thread is passing through those discs. You're going to have to also calibrate this return spring so that it's calibrated with a much lighter touch because we don't have the luxury of that little tab on the bottom like on the Husqvarna upper tensions that I showed you recently in, in that live stream. You guys remember that? I showed you that upper tension. I showed you how you can slide and reduce the range of motion for that take-up spring so that it's stressing the thread less as it's passing through those discs. And that's where I, I, I'll tell people all the time, if you're Wanting to use a heavier thread on a Singer sewing machine like this 99K, that's not a problem up until you get to about 40 or 50 weight type thread. 
But if you want to go heavier than that, if you want to get into some of the upholstery or the super heavy duty type threads, you want to be running that down in the bobbin case. Heavier thread down in the bobbin case because it doesn't have to work its way from here all the way to here through those discs around this up to the take up arm up here back down through this thread guide down here down finally through the needle so this path that thread has to travel from the top stresses that thread much more and that's why when you're trying to work with lighter threads heavier threads you have to make adjustments so that 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 path is lessened, lessened as far as stressing that thread. But the opposite, when you're working with heavier thread and you're trying to run it through the top, it's going to create a lot of havoc as far as trying to take that path with that heavier thread and eventually get all the way down to the needle and then sweep down through the throat plate. And that's why it's just easier. If you're working with a heavier thread, just put it down in your bobbin and then find an appropriate matching thread of similar color to put up on top so that the thread color is going to match. And, you know, to the general eye looking at it, it's going to be a perfect balance. It's going to be a perfect fit. If that makes sense or if that's helpful, uh, put a smiley face in the chat if you would, or, uh, you know, type something in the chat so that I know that explanation of the, the science of balancing with different types of threads, et cetera, blah, 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 uh, is somewhat helpful. I hope it is. But you can certainly get real pretty threads as well that are 100%, see if I can reach in here, 100% polyester, like this one right here. This is also, uh, this is not by Sulky, this is, uh, this is by Guterman. And uh, Guterman makes beautiful, beautiful threads and incredibly high quality threads. As the name would suggest, as you look at the name Guterman and you see above that U, you see those two little dots. Those are called an umlaut in German, an umlaut. And the umlaut uh, tells you right away that this is a German manufactured thread. Sulky, I think, is made in Germany as well, if I'm not mistaken. But the 100% polyester gives you so much more flexibility in your sewing applications than a thread like 100% rayon or... You guys have seen me sew with 100% silk thread as well. 100% silk thread is not nearly as much as a of a headache as the rayon stuff because as everyone knows from the different programs you've seen on the Discovery Channel, silk is surprisingly strong. And so you don't have to make any you don't have to make any significant adjustments when you're sewing with silk thread compared to when you're sewing with uh that rayon thread that I just showed you that real pretty red one by Sulky. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. All right. I could ramble all day long. You guys know that. Ramble, ramble, ramble. Ramble, ramble. All right. Let's do some more sewing. I don't knock anything off the shelf here. There we go. Okay. So I think I'll, I, I could ask all of you, um, blah, 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 blah. I could ask all of you again about the material that you want me to sew next. Emma's, Emma's been the only one that's been chiming in. So I'm almost a little bit reluctant to ask because Emma right now is trying to chat with Christina from Brazil. So, but I'll ask you anyway, because I, I love to involve all of you in what we're doing. So we've got this. 100% cotton with this stiffener. We could sew this next if you'd like. We have this uh, Kona cotton with the quilt batting in between. We've got this heavy grade denim. We've got this canvas material, and I've got different thickness options for that. Whoops, and I'm knocking stuff off. Oh, okay, almost got it. Wait, 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 there we go. I've got this bubblegum material, which is always a hoot to sew. Kind of see that. It's like a slinky. <laughs> and then I've got this commercial upholstery material uh, as well that we could certainly sew. So if anyone else other than Emma wants to chime in and say, Scott, would you sew this one next? Or whatever. 
that would be awesome. Um, otherwise, I'll just pick one, and that's fine too. And then eventually we'll circle back to leather again because I kind of described this live stream as a leather fest, didn't I? So I certainly want to honor that description and sew a lot of leather also. Yeah. We've already sewn a bunch of leather, though, haven't we? We've already done saddle grade leather, um, protected full grain leather, Italian leather. We did uh, genuine elk hide off camera. Oh, Delilah, thank you for that comment. That's great. That's great to have that feedback. Very cool. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Emma. And if I missed anybody else uh, typing something in, that would be cool. Okay, I'm just going to pick something. So again, we're sewing with our setup is a leather needle, right? We've got a 9014 uh, Schmetz leather needle. So most people, most people, when they sew 100% cotton, if they're sewing 100% cotton, they're generally not going to be sewing with a leather needle. But I do that to push the boundaries. I like pushing the boundaries when we're doing sew offs because it presses that machine. It presses that machine to have to perform even at a higher level to make up for that deficit of the setup that I've given the machine. Does that make sense? Because we've got a we've got a 9014 leather needle. We can sew leather and have great outcomes. But when we move to 100% cotton like this with a stiffener in between, it might throw us off a little bit. So we'll have to see. We'll have to see how this machine manages this sew off. And I'm going to put a little bit of music on because you've heard the machine running multiple times already. It's silky smooth and a little bit of a music background as we're doing this sew off. And this particular song I'm playing right now is called Go Down Swinging. Sounds like a boxing movie song, doesn't it? Go Down Swinging. Hey, yeah. All right. Oh, yeah, I'm liking this song. I've got my groove going right now. All right. 100% cotton with a stiffener sewn with a 9014 Schmetz leather needle a little bit crazy but whatever let's give it a go you know what i forgot to do i forgot to put my little clamps on to hold the material together but that's okay we'll just go with it All right, down to the finish. I didn't sew too straight, so just ignore that. Oh, perfectly ended right there. I love it. So I'm seeing something interesting, and I'll, I'll show you what I see in just a second here. And this comes back to when you're sewing with a particular type of needle and it has a certain type of point, a serrated point, and it has a certain scarf design and it has a certain shaft design because it's a leather sewing needle. It's going to react differently when it interacts with something like 100% cotton. Oh yeah. Yep. I can see it. I can see it. <laughs> Let's check this out. So this is our top stitch right here. Let me show it to you. It's not a bad looking top stitch, but if you look at it with a lot of scrutiny, if you look at it with a lot of scrutiny, it's almost a little bit on the weak side. It's a little bit light, which means if we want to have this top stitch even more pronounced, tell me what we need to do. 
what do we need to do either with the bobbin case or with the upper tension? Again, I think it's a good looking top stitch, but we could make it even poppier if we make an adjustment. Tell me what that adjustment is, would you? Top stitch, top stitch, top stitch. That song ended kind of abruptly. That was a little bit borderline annoying. Oh, look at I sewed over a thread. That was fun. So again, we've got a good looking top stitch. It's definitely in the realm of page 34. And page 34 is just something I came up with to describe a near perfect stitch. I say all the time, and my uh, a number of my friends that work in this space as well, they always get a little testy with me because they say, why do you tell people in your audience, why do you tell them that there's no such thing as a perfect stitch? Uh, well, um, let me think about that. Oh, because there's no such thing as a perfect stitch. You can always make a stitch better, either by having a more appropriate setup, like don't sew cotton with a leather needle as a general rule, or having a different type of presser foot attachment, maybe a roller foot or a walking foot. That's really annoying me. Hold on a second. I got to get that puppy out of there if I can do it. Hold on. <laughs> yes, victory. So you can always make the stitch better. You can always make it better. And that's why I say there's no such thing as a perfect stitch. Sometimes changing your setup, a different type of needle, a different type of thread. Sometimes it's a factor also of presser foot pressure. Sometimes it's a factor of of uh, the upper tension being adjusted off a little bit for that type of material. You sometimes have to tweak it a little bit. If you're going to be sewing that stuff all day long, you might have to tweak it a little bit to get it absolutely spot on. But again, we've got a very good looking, kind of look at it from the side as well. We've got a very good looking top stitch. Certainly we, we can be proud of it. So I'm going to look at the chat real quick to see if you answered correctly as far as what do we do? What do we do if we want to make that top stitch even more pronounced than it is right now? Let me look at this, the chat. Do you use cotton fabric with cotton thread? We are about to find out. <laughs> I love it. Terry's got a great sense of humor. Did you guys notice Terry's comment? Very fun. Very fun. So your top thread, let me, let me, I, I'm kind of looking at the chat. And if I miss something in a live chat, uh, don't be afraid to reach out afterwards or ask one of the, the moderators if they would forward that question to me. Uh, because these questions are important. And as I'm trying to manage things over at the workbench over here during the live stream, I might miss a question. But Terry was mentioning something about her thread keeps shredding. Shredding thread is usually going to be because your upper tension is turned up too high. It's creating too much stress on that thread. Again, as, as a... Upper as as that as you lower that as you lower that uh, let me let me change this shot as you lower that presser foot lever right here you lower it down see what happens with that upper tension no pressure on the discs pressure on the discs you can kind of see them kind of watch them clamp together no pressure you can actually kind of I'm wiggling them look at mom look at look at look at look at so, and then when you apply that pressure, all of a sudden, boom, those, those discs are pressing on that thread right now. They're creating that tension factor. And if you have this turned up too high, it's going to be creating too much tension. Again, remember we talking about the path, the path that the thread on top has to go. It's got to, I mean, it's like going down a highway. All the way down here. So the more pressure on the thread, the more likely it is to create shredding, uh, to break the thread, and just stress the thread. That's the real big deal 
when it comes to uh, trying to work with the threat factor. The other thing that can be also contributing, Terry, as well, if I understand your question correctly, the other thing that can contribute as well is the type of needle that you're using as well can also create issues. In other words, the, the size of the eye of the needle, let me adjust this a little bit, the size of the eye of the needle, again, the needle uh, design, the engineering of the needle, what kind of scarp design does it have? Uh, there's a number of factors that can create that shredding, but it's typically associated with the tension. That upper tension is just too, it's putting too much stress, too much stress on that, on that thread that you're using. And again, look at the type of thread you're using as well. I talked about that sulky 100% uh, rayon thread where you've got to do a number of adjustments to manage a thread like that because it's so fragile. So that can also contribute as well. So this is our top stitch. We didn't even flip it over. I'm happy with our top stitch. Good looking top stitch. What is our lock stitch going to look like? Any difference? It's gorgeous. So again, the, the setup we have right now is not ideal. It's not an ideal setup. We're sewing with a leather needle, which has a totally different point, scarf, and shaft design. It's designed to work with leather, not with 100% cotton like this. And yet, as I already said, because of my process on this 99K, 130 plus steps, bobbing the balance wheel, the machine made up for the deficit of my poor choice in setup. It was actually a very intentional poor choice in setup, but um, I like to push the machines hard. You know what I mean? I like to push the machines hard. I really do, especially when we get to this, this big celebration, this premiere, this live stream, where the next step is this 99K is either going to stay in the workshop because I've got to do something else to make it right, or it's going to graduate and start heading towards Washington State to join Lisa out there with the 201-2 that I already sent her. So let's hope for a graduation. Let's hope in our sewing Olympics that we continue to get results like this and that this machine gets more gold medals in the sewing Olympics and it graduates with flying colors. You know what I mean? That's what we're aiming for. So this is a definite pass, 100% cotton with this stiffener in it. And we got incredible results from this machine lock stitch, top stitch. So I'm going to throw that back into our little pile, our little mounting pile back here of uh, the sew-offs that we've done either on the live stream or prior to it. And now we got to make some more decisions. What are we going to sew next? Are we going to go back to leather again? Are we going to sew some of the other materials that I have? I want to give that choice to you guys, but if you don't respond, then I'll have to make the choice uh, myself. So again, the, the non-leather stuff that we have left that I've already pre-cut is we have this Kona cotton uh, with this uh, quilt batting in between. We've got this uh, heavy grade denim. We've got this canvas material. We've got the bubble gum material. And then we have the commercial upholstery material. So if anyone wants to type into the live chat what you want me to sew next, I will go ahead and do that. Otherwise... I'll go ahead and make a choice and keep this live stream moving. Helen wants to see canvas. Cool. Let's do some canvas set. And canvas, if you don't know it, is, is it's, it's part of the reason that people will specialize in canvas sewing. Uh, whether they're making boat covers or whatever else, maybe they're making tents uh, or other things that require canvas. Um, it's a very specialized type trade uh, because it's tricky stuff to get through. If you just if you just look at the webbing of this, it almost looks like a Kevlar type material. Kind of look at the webbing. It's it's kind of a, a nasty looking Kevlar material. It has a great tendency to distort stitching. It has a great tendency to create skip stitches. It has a great tendency to create wonky stitches, for lack of a better description. Wonky stitches in the sense that it's gonna, it's gonna deform the stitch or it's gonna take away the clarity of the stitch. So when we're sewing something like this, I've got a single layer here 
I'm going to go ahead and fold this in half so we're doing two layers of this canvas material. And it's not ridiculously thick, but it's kind of like our acrylic fiber that you use to make awnings. I've sewn it on this channel a million times. Don't, don't judge the difficulty of a sew-off by the thickness of the material. Because materials, the composition, the, made, the way they're manufactured, the way they're, uh, they're engineered can really create havoc for a machine, um, even if you have the ideal setup. And with canvas, leather needles are not the worst choice, but there certainly are better needles that we could be using if we're going to be sewing canvas all day long. So we're going to start with two layers and see how this uh, setup that we have, the machine is ready to do it. But again, I've given it a little bit of a deficit as far as the setup, a little bit of a challenge as far as the setup. All right. I love music. I'll leave the music off for this so off so you can listen to this machine operating. Again, I'll just show you real quick as a reminder. I'll kind of bring the camera up. Right now, our take up arm is almost at the top, but it's not. And so I'm going to make a little of, uh, of an adjustment. Let's see if I come down to here, you can see it. Yeah, you can. I'm going to make a little bit of an adjustment with the balance wheel. See how it's going up, 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 up. Okay, now it's at the pinnacle. And now it's getting ready to do that down sweep. See that? Almost like it's dancing. It's kind of, We should have music on so it can dance, but we're not going to do it. We're going to be good. So it's on that down sweep. This is the ideal way to launch no matter what kind of material you're sewing. doesn't matter if it's canvas, leather, cotton, you name it. Always take that take-up arm to the pinnacle and then just a little bit beyond where it's starting to down sweep. Okay? All right, let me shut my light off. Get this back over here. There we go. Okay, so we're going to try this canvas. We'll go two layers and we'll see how it manages this sew off. And then we might step it up and maybe do three layers or four layers or five layers or six layers. You never know. But again, uh, setup is important and we haven't given this all of the opportunity to succeed. So let's see what happens. I'm going to go down and around and we'll see how this machine does. It'll probably do much better than I will. All right, here we go. I'm going to stop right there. Rotate that needle down, raise my presser foot, kind of get it aligned a little bit. We're only going to be sewing about two or three stitches, and then I'll be going back down to the finish line. Oh, I went too far. Ah, I'm right on. I'm right on the edge. Oh, gumdrops. See that? I get a little distracted. Now I'm lifting it up, and now it'll be out of alignment. But oh well. Oh well. All right, now we'll sew down to the finish, and you'll just have to ignore that little oopsie down at the bottom there. All right, down to the finish. Again, we're sewing canvas, two layers of it, with a leather needle and with the dual-duty Coates & Clark thread. Here we go. There we go. All right. So let's see how this... 99k managed to sew off with the setup that we've given it. All right, let me back the camera up a little bit. I'm going to come up like this. So this is our top stitch right here. Oops, hold on a second. This is our top stitch. Get a little bit closer if I can. What I'm seeing is I'm seeing, number one, the machine managed this very well as far as keeping a, a balance of tension. Considering we're using a very different style needle than you would usually use on canvas. And it gave us some very, very nice looking, there's my little mistake at the top. Uh, it gave us some very good looking stitches. I would say page 34, uh, the spacing, the formation, the integrity of the stitch. We don't see any distortion of the stitch. We see that the alignment of the stitching is spot on. We don't see any skip stitches. At least I don't think so. We'll kind of look top to bottom.
I'm going to turn my light on. Hold on a second. There we go. I think the light helps a little bit when you're close up like this. It's almost ready to focus. Any second now, it's going to say, okay, I'm going to focus now. We'll go distant and then kind of walk it in. So some real good looking stitching. This again is our top stitch. All right, what about our lock stitch? What are we gonna see on our lock stitch? This is our lock stitch now. Are we going to see anything dramatic? Anything scary? Hopefully not. This is our lock stitch. Let me kind of get it lined up as best as I can. So you notice, you, you should notice immediately, you should notice immediately that our lock stitch is uh, noticeably more poppy than our top stitch. You kind of adjust that again. Our lock stitch is noticeably more poppy than our top stitch, which tells me if we were going to be sewing canvas all day long using a leather needle, because you know why? We're rebels. We're rebels. And we want to use a leather needle to sew canvas. We just do. Then if we were going to be sewing this all day long, what we would have to do is we would have to back off that upper tension just a little bit. Because right now we have a, a, a lock stitch that is really, really solid page 34. It's gorgeous but it's almost taken a little bit away from that top stitch. So what we do then is if our, if our lock stitch is a little bit too pronounced, we back off that upper tension just a little bit. And what it allows to happen then is it allows that bobbin case to pull down a little bit harder. Think of it again as a tug of war. The bobbin case is pulling down. The upper tension is pulling up to create that stitch. So if our lock stitch, if we look at it and we go, oh, that's a lovely lock stitch, but our top stitch isn't, it's still very good, but it's not quite as lovely as our lock stitch. I want them both to be lovely because lovely is lovely, right? Yeah. So if we wanted to do that, then we would just back off the upper tension ever so slightly. And then that bobbin case would be able to pull down a little bit harder and give us a little bit more of a poppy lock stitch. Now, if you look at it right there, there's our lock stitch. Looks really good. Very, very nice. Kind of lean it a little bit so you can kind of look down the line. Turn it over. It's still a very good looking top stitch, right? It's a lovely top stitch. But I know that all of you, because you're so doggone smart, you're as particular as I am. And if you really, really study it closely and you go, okay, beautiful, beautiful top stitch. Love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. Beautiful lock stitch, but that lock stitch has a little bit more pizzazz. So just think of it like that. We can look at it from the side as well and kind of give you a different perspective. There's our lock stitch, two layers of canvas. There's our top stitch, two layers of canvas. They're both really close, but again, just think of it like this. Think of it like this, okay? If you're working with a particular type of material, your setup is not ideal. And you want to try to get the best possible balance between the lock stitch, the top stitch, etc. Then remember that tug of war analogy that I talk about all the time. The tug of war. The tug of war is, again, the bobbin case right over here is pulling down for all it's worth. It's, it's just... It's, it's literally breaking a sweat. It's Let's see if it's sweating. Hold on a second. Yep, a little bit of sweat right there. There it is. A little bit of sweat. So it's pulling down for all it's worth to try to give us a beautiful top stitch. At the same time, this bully up here, this bully up here is saying, uh-uh, it's not your day today. It's mine. 
And this upper tension is pulling up for all it's worth to give us a beautiful lock stitch. And so they're fighting against each other, pulling back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So just keep that in mind as you're changing types of material, as you have different setups, different, oops, that was exciting. As you're, as you're using different types of needles, different types of threads, uh, just take that into account. And if you've got everything else set up perfectly, and let's say you're, you're aiming for a six to seven stitch type outcome, kind of like we have right here. There it is. If you're aiming for a six to seven stitch outcome, like we have right here, and those stitches are looking stubby, stubby meaning you're not getting the fullness of that stitch. Then the other thing that I haven't pointed to yet that really could be an important factor, we've talked about tension, we've talked about setup, we've talked about needle type, we've talked about sweating bobbins, which is really weird, and we've talked about thread type and everything else. The only other thing that can play dramatically into the outcome you get as far as stitch is the presser foot control right up here. This has a huge impact on stitch quality and the fullness of stitch. Because if this is insufficient, it's going to allow those feed dogs to allow that material to kind of slide through. Uh, and you're not going to get an even beautiful stitch like you're seeing right here. You're not going to get it. Of course, you can't see it because the camera's decided, again, that it doesn't want to focus. Ah, okay. Well, at any rate, so the presser foot control, if you're dealing with heavier materials, you're going to be increasing this, turning it clockwise, just like if you're looking down on it with a clock. Turn it clockwise, you increase it. If you're dealing with the silks, satins, and other delicate materials, you're going to turn it counterclockwise to decrease this. Because if you don't do that, what it's going to do is it's going to cause bunching as, you, as that material is trying to feed underneath those feed dogs and or over those feed dogs and underneath that presser foot. And there's too much pressure pushing down. It's going to cause that material to be uh, bunching and uh, it's going to cause all kinds of havoc as far as the sew off. So when you go lighter, you back this off. When you go heavier, you increase this. OK, another big factor when it comes to the quality and the caliber of the stitching that we're looking to achieve. Yeah, see, now I decided all of a sudden, all right, I messed with Scott enough. He's going to pull my cord any second now and end the live stream. And now it said, okay, I'll focus now. I'll be a good camera. Yeah, yeah. So at any rate, this is a pass as well. I'm going to go ahead and throw it back into our pile back here of uh, sew-offs that we've already done in this live stream. With the exception, again, of this genuine elk hide and uh, this protected full grain leather where I did a, a number of adjustments for the machine. But everything else has been done on this live stream. Okay, so I'm going to pick out a little bit more music. While I'm picking out more music, would you be so kind as to... I'm just looking at the chat, seeing if there's anything else I need to look at... What uh, what look? Uh, Helen wrote a comment of looks loose. What uh, what was loose on this? Because I'm not seeing anything loose on that sew off that we just did. The spacing, the formation, the integrity of the stitch. Um, as I jokingly say, the glory of the stitch is absolutely bang on. There's no looseness at all. Other than where I goofed up down on the end here. Remember when I, I went too far off the material and I had to lift the presser foot and then I had to kind of move the material. But the the, the tension on this is really quite nice. Uh, this top stitch and the lock stitch as well. Uh, no looseness factor that I can see uh, whatsoever. So I'll, I'll look at Helen's comment again, but... Um, I'm not seeing it. It's certainly not with this so off. It's absolutely as it should be. Spot on, spot on. So I'll throw that to the back and uh, we'll move on to our next so off after I pick out a little bit of music for us. 
uh, to enjoy. I just had a dom. Helen is such a cool. I am so glad Helen is here. She is such a hoot. Isn't she? God bless Helen. I love Helen. I don't even know where Helen is from, but I'll probably visit that state and do a, a, a free service on her sewing machine because she's such a great addition to our live stream. Don't you agree? I mean, we have a number of great people that are part of the live stream. Don't get me wrong there. But... Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful outcome when you can generate stitch quality like this with a less than ideal setup. Setup on a sewing machine is so critical. Uh, if you're sewing a lot of denim, you really should be using a denim needle because of the engineering and design of that needle. It's more compatible with that type of, of, of fabric. If you're sewing leather like this stuff, Sewing with a leather needle is the best choice. And then you always want to pick your thread carefully as well, right? And again, like I've already talked about, you want to make sure that depending on the kind of thread you're using, especially if you're using that nasty 100% rayon stuff, that you also calibrate your upper tension to be compatible with that thread as well and adjust your upper tension down quite a ways if you're sewing with rayon. So you should be mindful of that. I mean, it's... Sewing machine makers, they always want to be peddling their lies about the machine being maintenance-free. Remember I had that more contemporary machine recently on the workbench, and I, I said that Singer, Singer now is saying that these machines are basically maintenance-free. And yet when I went through, there we go, when I went through that machine, you could see how filthy it was and how that that filth and dirt and buildup and junk and everything else and old crusty oil was just choking the life out of that machine. And it was causing that machine to have to work so much harder than it otherwise would. Uh, don't buy those lies. You know, if you decide for whatever reason to pick up a more contemporary machine, realize that that machine is going to need servicing. And it's going to need more servicing than the average service center is going to give it. Again, when you go to an average sewing back or sewing center, they've got a lot of overhead. They have usually multiple employees, even if it's a family business. They have uh, the cost of sometimes leasing that property as well. The overhead, all of that stuff factors into what they can do for you and your machine. So they'll spend about 45 minutes to an hour on your machine. When a machine like this is being prepared in the workshop, I'm going to spend about somewhere between 8 to 12 hours on that machine, depending on what it needs. Again, I go through my checklist. I go through my checklist, 130 blocks that I have to check off for a machine like this. I'm not going to skip any of them just to you know try to make the process quicker. That's a disservice and I would say a dishonor to the owner. And the trust that they put in me in trying to take care of their machine as best as I can. So I'm going to go through every single check block, no matter what the owner has told me, and verify that it's actually as it should be. So that means bobbing the balance wheel. So, you know, just keep that in mind. It, it, as your machine ages or as you put it in storage or whatever it is, it's going to need more attention typically than what you can get at your local sewing center. And there are exceptions to that. Thank God. There are exceptions to that. And some of you have told me about your local service center where that gentleman or lady, they really embrace the philosophy of doing it right. You know, do it right or go home. And how fortunate you are to have one of those. A lot of folks around the country don't. A lot of the folks around the world don't. And that's why we recently, you remember, I think you remember, we recently got that, um, what the heck was it? Ah! It's a, it's a Husqvarna, I know that. We got that Husqvarna all the way from London, England that Adam sent to the workshop because he goes, I don't trust anybody, anybody more than you, Scott. The way you do things, the way you document things and all that blah, blah, blah stuff. So he, he packed and shipped his machine and shipped it all the way from London, England. I'm honored by that. I am so honored because imagine how many sewing places, repair shops, et cetera, are between London, England, and Oconto, Wisconsin. Imagine. It's mind-blowing. There's got to be hundreds of them. 
And yet Adam and Heidi from Switzerland and other places like that, and, and certainly in the U.S., I mean, this machine, this owner could have bought machines a lot closer to Washington State than Oconto, Wisconsin. But again, folks, after they follow for a while, they, they begin to understand it's a different process, right? It's a different process. All right, blah, 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 blah. All right, let's uh, get some more music on and do some more sewing. What do we have here? Ooh, hey, the next song title is called The Itch. So when I start playing this music, if all of a sudden you get this urge to start scratching yourself, blame the song, blame, blame the music. Yeah, blame the music. It's opening up with a soft piano piece. How is that itchy? I don't get it. Oh, there. Now we're itching. Now we're itching. Oh, yeah, I'm itching now. I'm definitely itching. Yikes. All right, what should we sew next? Should we maybe do some denim? We got this heavy grade denim stuff. Let's do that. So I'm starting with two layers of denim, right? I'm going to go ahead and fold it in the middle, get us up to four layers. I'm going to fold it one more time and get us up to six layers of heavy grade denim. Six layers of heavy grade denim that we're, by the way, going to be sewing with a 9014 size leather needle. Yeah, I know. But you guys love this channel because we're crazy, right? We're just a little bit crazy. And I'm just going to sew down the middle. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to sew down the middle of this. See, this presser foot, this is a different style presser foot. It really pitches up a lot. See that? And you can see all the, the, the back of the material right now is a little bit off of that presser foot. I don't want to make that mistake again like I did on that one where I kind of skidded. So I'm going to slide it in a little bit deeper. All right. How's my take-up arm looking? Take-up arm is right there. Are we at the sweet spot? We are. Look at that. Perfect. Exactly where we want to be. It's on the downstroke right now, and we're not going to get any binding. We're not going to get any resistance at all as we launch into this six layers of heavy grade denim. No resistance, no pause, no hesitation. There we go. That's a fun shot. Look, Mom, I'm on top of the house. All right, here we go. Six layers of heavy grade denim with this little Mighty Might from 1954, a 99K, which was made in, type in the chat where this machine was made. Where was this machine made? Type it in the chat. Please, please, please. Here we go. <laughs> I went off course a little bit. That was fun. All right. Exactly right. Um, Terry, Terry, Terry's going to have to stay. Terry's going to have to go to summer school. I love Terry. Just met her. She's brilliant. She's a great student and a teacher, but she wrote down Great Britain. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> she can argue. Well, Scott, the machine is stamped Great Britain, man. All right. But the machine, the machine was made in Scotland. The machine was made in Scotland. Just so you all know that. So no harm, no follow, no foul. Blah. Yeah, again, kind of the telltale clue where you can definitely know is if that serial number starts with an E. E. That's kind of fun to say. E. If the serial number starts with an E like this one does, EJ. 705519. It's a it's a Scott Scottish machine. It's a Scottish machine. So all right. So what are we doing now? I lost track. Here we go. All right. We just did the sew off. Yay. Okay. So I'm gonna see. Oh, interesting. Okay. Okay, let's look at this side first. <clears throat> 
We're actually going to do it backwards. We usually do it the other way. We're looking at the lock stitch right now. Turn my little light on. This this new camera has a light on it, which is kind of interesting. It's called a a ring a ring camera, kind of like ring the bell. And uh, so, in certain situations, it 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 makes it more difficult for the camera to focus. In other instances, it makes it a lot easier for the camera to see what it wants to see because it's an auto adjusted camera. So we're looking at the lock stitch right now, which you know what? I'm just going to be honest with you. I think it's absolutely gorgeous. I really do. Let me, let me kind of hold it like this. I can move it more evenly. So again, we just sewed these six layers of heavy grade denim with a leather needle, dual duty Coates and Clark uh, type thread. And uh, we got a great result. The, the quality of the stitching, the spacing, the formation, the alignment of the stitching is absolutely as we want it to be. It's, it's a very, very good looking, a very, very good looking uh, lock stitch. We can look at it like this as well from the side. I sometimes like to look at stitches like this because it gives you a different perspective of the stitch. Let me kind of bring it across. So I would give this a solid page 34 as far as this top, this uh, lock stitch, excuse me. I would give a, a solid page 34 to this lock stitch. What I had noticed when I first pulled this out from underneath the presser foot is that when you're sewing this much heavy grade denim and you're using a leather needle and it's cutting through that, that denim in a different way than say a denim needle would based on the point and the shaft and the scarf and all the blah, blah, blah stuff. Um, it gives a little bit more of an advantage to that upper tension to get a better defined lock stitch. And it takes a little bit away from the top stitch. Let me show you what I mean. I mean, this is still a good looking top stitch. Don't get me wrong. But if we wanted to make it even better, I talk about in this classroom regularly about the Kanai principle. And if anyone that's a regular wants to type into the chat, what does Kanai mean? C-A-N-I, C-A-N-I. What does that mean? That's Scott's thing. What does Kanai mean? And, and why does he say you can, you can make this even better, even though it's a, a good looking top stitch? Come on, camera. You're on duty, camera. Be good, be good. So we've got a we've got a good looking top stitch. You can kind of look at it like this as well if you'd like. Let me turn it around. Constant. Um, he has so much affection. Christine is a sweetie. I, I've never been to Brazil, but that would be a fun place to visit, wouldn't it? That'd be a fun place to visit. So our stitching looks really good both ways, but uh, Kanai stands for constant and never-ending improvement. Constant and never-ending improvement. That means even if we have a good-looking stitch, we can make it better, in this case, by backing off that upper tension a little bit. If we were going to be sewing a ton of denim, six layers thick look at that using a leather needle then we would want to back off that upper tension a little bit just to give a little bit more pizzazz to that top stitch it's a good looking top stitch but it could even be better looking if we gave a little bit more muscle back to that bobbin case down here to pull down remember again and i know i cover this a lot but remember that that bobbin case is going to be pulling down to give us a good looking top stitch that upper tension right here is going to be pulling up to give us a good lock stitch. So they're going to be fighting all the time. It's like mortal combat. It's like mortal combat where they're saying, no, no, I want my top stitch 
No, no, I want my lock stitch. No, no, I want my top stitch. Give me more for my top stitch. And sometimes we have to make that decision of saying, okay, we're going to, we're going to back off this upper tension a little bit and give us a little bit more pronounced uh, top stitch. And I can't get quite the right angle. It's a, it's a very lovely top stitch, but it's underserved ever so slightly. It's just underserved ever so slightly. There we got it. See the camera's back on duty again. Thank you, camera. Beautiful stitching both ways. And again, we did this with a leather needle, six layers of heavy grade denim. Absolute success, absolute pass. But I just want to highlight for you again, we can always make it better. So this goes back in the pile with our other stuff. So far on this live stream, we've done denim. We've done canvas. We've done 100% cotton with a stiffener. Off camera, I did this elk hide. Actually, I'm going to do elk hide right now because I keep showing this to you. We did protected full grain leather off camera. We did Italian leather uh, on camera. Again, this Italian leather is such beautiful leather to work with. I can only imagine that in the real fancy cars, like the Lamborghinis and other cars like that, um, this is probably the type of leather that they're going to be using in those real fancy cars because it's just gorgeous leather. And, and look at those stitches present. Put it right there. Oh, there you tried to focus. Good camera, good camera. Hey, let's do it this way. Maybe you like this better. There, it likes it better sideways for some reason. I have no idea why. So, but Italian leather is beautiful leather. If you've never tried it before, pick up some Italian leather somewhere and uh, be amazed at the stitch quality you can generate. And yeah, we're using a leather needle, but I could do the same thing with this 99K if we had a universal needle in there as well. I could probably do it with a denim needle. You never know. So, but we've done a lot of sewing already. Most people would be content to say, oh, we're done, for goodness sakes. We've done it. We've done it. That's not us. We've got more to do yet. So, all right. So I'm going to take a quick look at the chat, see if there's anything that I've missed, which I probably have. Oh, hello to Michelle. I didn't see Michelle pop in. And if and if there's anybody else in the live chat that I haven't said hello to, I apologize. I see if, uh, Michelle is here. And I think everybody else on the screen that I'm seeing right now, I've already said hello to. Yep, I did. Okay, a little bit of music and let's do some more sewing with this 99K. This one is called No Turning Back. No Turning Back. <laughs> this is a fun song. My foot's tapping. I won't be able to operate the foot controller. Help! 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 Oh, yeah. Great song. This is a fun song. Well, it was, and then it just stopped. See, that YouTube was doing so well. I was going to send them a note saying, thanks for fixing the problem. And now the music just stopped on its own again. So to them, to YouTube. All right. So let's do some genuine elk hide now. I'll show you from the side what we're going to be sewing. Let me back this camera up just a little bit because it's having trouble focusing, I think. So we're going to be sewing this... Um, Genuine elk hide. Elk hide is chemically processed. So what it does, it's kind of like the protected full grain leather. If you've ever heard of protected full grain leather, uh, what they do is they coat it in the processing of the leather so that it kind of galvanizes the surface and it protects it from staining. It makes that leather a little bit more durable, depending on how that leather is going to be applied and used. They do the same thing, in, slightly different with the elk hide, where they chemically treat it to make that leather more durable and uh, also to just kind of fortify fortify the composition of the leather 
if you've ever seen real, real old leather where it starts to deteriorate, it almost rots, kind of starts to fall apart. Um, when they take leathers like this, elk hide, the protected full grain leather, they're trying to uh, overcome that issue of the leather aging and also give it more durability. So that's kind of that's kind of the blah, blah, blah on leather. And I'm not a leather expert. There are leather people out there that are a lot smarter than I am on leather. Uh, but that's been my experience in working with these. There we go. I did a better job. See that? It's kind of like it's got that leather all the way underneath the presser foot where I'm not going to be sliding or slipping, hopefully. There we go. There's a good shot. So I'm going to, uh, I want to honor your time. I, I And I, I'm so grateful to have such a great audience and and all of you, uh, many of you stepping out of the shadows and kind of interacting with other folks in the chat as well. Uh, and, and just being a part of this, I know you've got, you've got busy lives. I'm very grateful for your time and, and, we, and we can learn together and we can celebrate together this great machine that's going to be heading to Washington state either later today or tomorrow, uh, for Lisa to enjoy. But right now we've got this very thick, about four to five ounces. You can see it from the side of this genuine elk hide. Now we got to try to get through this and I'm going to try to do it again without a hand start. I'm just going to dig into it, hit that foot controller and see if we can make it happen. I'm also off camera going to adjust that take up arm to the highest position. So it's on the downstroke and that'll give us a huge advantage so that we'll have more punch, more punch and more piercing power down at the needle. All right. You ready? All right. We don't have any dramatic music, so at home or at work or wherever you are, in your car, on a beach somewhere, uh, up in a mountain, in a cabin, you can hum as we're sewing since we have no music. All right, that'll work. Cool. Hum louder. I can't hear you. All right, here we go. No hand start. Just the sheer grit of that 0.7 amp motor that I keep talking about. Again, this is going to have almost this little mighty mite. If you were to look at the, let me back up the camera. If you were to look at this machine from this end of the bed all the way over to here on the other side of the pillar, that distance right there, this is shorter in overall bed length than a Singer Featherweight. I'll say it again, from here to here, this machine, this three quarter size 99K from 1954 is so compact that it's actually shorter than a Singer Featherweight 221, 221-1, 222K, blah, 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 blah. It doesn't matter. It's shorter in overall bed length. And yet it almost, almost has two times the power of the Featherweight. That's why I, I really try to highlight on this channel the beauty of, of the 99, the 99K, and the Spartan. They're all part of that same family. And again, the Spartan can even say, hey, guess what? I got a little bit more muscle. The Spartan, which is also called a 192K, actually has a 0.8 amp motor, 0.80. So it is two times more powerful than the Featherweight. And it actually has more powerful, more, more power than a 201-2, the Rolls-Royce of Singers that I talk about all the time on this channel. And it has more power than the 1591 that everybody loves. So pretty amazing. Pretty, pretty doggone amazing. I guess the old saying of good things come in small packages, it applies. It totally applies to the Class 99 machines and certainly to the 192K, the Spartan. They just have, they have so much power for their frame. They're like a little Goliath. They're like a little Goliath going after the, the giant leather and saying, you will not win. I will defeat you. I will not throw a stone. I will use a leather needle. Ha ha. Yeah, they will. So let's take a look at this one. This is our uh, genuine elk hide. Let's see how the machine did with this sew off. Once it decides it's going to focus. Waiting, waiting. Almost there. We're so close. Oh, come on. Come on now. You're on duty. Do I have to go sideways with you? Do I have to go sideways? 
All right, sideways. Yes, we'll go sideways then if that makes you happier, camera. Okay, I think we're almost there. We're so close. So this is a genuine elk hide. And this little 99K, it just, it nailed it. It nailed it. It's exactly what we want to be seeing. Again, look at the, look at it from the side. The spacing, the formation, the integrity of the stitch. A solid page 34. And this, again, is our top stitch. So as we look at this beautiful top stitch, type in the chat, should we be giving credit I mean, really, it's a team effort, right? It's a team effort between the upper tension and the bobbin case as far as generating a great top stitch like this. Because if the upper tension, again, is a bully, it's going to take away from our top stitch. But here we've got a gorgeous top stitch. Absolutely drop-dead gorgeous. And we have to give credit to the bobbin case. The bobbin case did an excellent job. Now we're going to look at that lock stitch. And the lock stitch, again, we have to give credit to that upper tension for generating a great-looking lock stitch. But we also have, we have to give credit as well to the bobbin case for not being a bully and taking away from the lock stitch, right? It's a cooperative effort. It's a team effort. Come on, camera. This camera thinks it's the weekend or something. I don't know what's going on. Ah. All right, let's go vertical then. We're going to totally mess with it. We're almost there. We're so close. Ah. Maybe if I give it a bigger field to look at, huh? Okay, I, I, I almost got it. I'm so close. There it is. That's our lock stitch, which again is absolutely as it should be. And again, look at what we just sewed through. Back up a little bit. Can you see that? You talk about belts, right? Whether it's a woman's belt, a biker's belt, a man's belt, a farmer's belt, a farmer in the Dell, who knows what. But when you have a little mighty mite like this, a three-quarter size 99K that can burst through without a hand start, this much leather, and lay down stitching like that and like that. That's absolutely brag worthy. Amazing. All right, I'm not going to belabor it any further. Let's add it to our pile over here, our growing pile. And guys, this is all that we have left over here. We've got, let me show you. We've got this protected full grain leather. We have more elk hide. We've got some of this genuine cowhide, this white stuff. We've got saddle grade leather that we kind of launched with. We've got some of this uh, Italian leather, I think it is, and this is protected on the bottom. And then we've got over here some bubble gum, if anybody likes, anyone want any bubble gum? Uh, we've got Kona cotton, which we haven't sewn yet. We already did canvas. We've got bubblegum material. Maybe we can do bubblegum material next. And then we've got commercial uh, upholstery material right here on the bottom. So does anyone have any strong input as to what you would like us to sew next from either the leather pile or from this other pile over here that's a little bit more diverse? Commercial upholstery material, blah, 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 all those different choices. Oh, hi, Mindy. 
So, oh, and hello to Susie, too, from Minnesota. Uh, Susie is saying, let's do Kona Cotton. So that's what we're going to do next. This is our Kona Cotton right here. Let's do Kona. And again, this Kona Cotton has this quilt batting in the middle. And we're going to be sewing this 100% Kona Cotton with quilt batting using a leather needle, which is kind of... It's kind of fun, isn't it? Yeah. It's a little bit demented, but it's fun too. All right. And on this coat of cotton, I'll try to go down and around. And I'm probably going to use some little clamps on this to make it a little bit easier on myself. I'll try to use these clamps, maybe. All right. We'll put a clamp right about there. And again, if you use if you use clamps with your sewing projects, just be aware as this needle bar, as this needle bar swings down, that needle clamp needs to be able to clear depending on the height and the profile of the clamps you're using. So just be mindful of that as you kind of sew down and around with something like this, that you don't have that needle bar clamp all of a sudden hit one of your other clamps. It's like a clamp, a clamp collision or something like that. You know, we might have to call like a medical crew and it just, it'd be ugly. It'd be ugly. Okay. So let's check this out. See what we think. Okay. Check this one out now. All right, here we go. I'm going to try to go down around. Let me check my take up arm. Even on cotton, even on light cotton. I always make sure that take-up arm is at the highest position. Got to do it. Got to do it. Got to do it. All right, here we go. Down and around. Did I stop in time? Yes, I did. Hooray. See that? This kid can learn. Yeah, I love it. I'm going to take my clamps off just temporarily. Kind of go across here and then we'll go down. Perfect, 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 perfect. All right, let me try to get this. It's just caught by the feed dogs a little bit. There we go. I think I got it. I think I got it. Hope I got it. So you can see right now the presser foot is off the material a little bit. And this is where we might run into a little bit of a hiccup. We'll have to wait and see what happens. But right now the butt, the butt of the presser foot attachment is on the feed dogs. It's not underneath the material. That's not ideal. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna continue to try to go through this as we have it, but uh, we might see a little bit of slippage again just because it's it's off of the material. And also you don't want to be doing this all the time because I've said it before, when you have feed dogs making direct contact with the presser foot attachment, it can cause scarring to the bottom of the presser foot attachment, which can snag, can begin to snag material, but it also can dull the feed dogs too. Metal against metal is never a good idea. Uh, unless you're sharpening a knife, then yeah, you know what I mean. So, so we're going to try to launch with this carefully. I'm going to kind of really be watching this. I hope it doesn't slip too badly and we'll get through this. All right, here we go. Oh, it was all dramatic and it just went like, hey, what's the big deal, man? I got this. And you can see we're living a little bit dangerously right now because I talked a lot about the presser foot pressure, right? This adjustment. Uh, up here, and we didn't we didn't adjust it down like I said you normally would do. We didn't adjust it down uh, after sewing leather and you know all those layers of denim and uh, canvas and everything else. We just kind of left it where it was at, but the machine still managed it well, and that's pretty doggone impressive because normally if you're sewing Kona cotton or any type of 100% cotton you're going to want to back off that upper tension. Uh, excuse me, you're going to, forget what I just said. You're going to want to back off that 
that uh, presser foot pressure just a little bit. So this is going to be a little bit more of a challenge to see. White thread against this white Kona cotton, but we'll see what we can do with this camera. See if the camera will be nice to us. <clears throat> I might even see if I can lay it down. Maybe that will work. Let's see if this will work. I'm going to shut off the light on it. Okay, we we almost can see it there. It's pretty doggone clear. Folks, those are gorgeous, gor gor gorgeous stitches. They really are. I'm going to try to slide it across. Ah, there we go. Let me shut this light off. Hold on. Oh boy, that made a big difference. I shut I shut this light off, this one right here, and uh, all of a sudden we've got a lot better clarity. Look at that. Oh my gosh. See how important lighting is when you're doing video and live streams and stuff? It's just mind-blowing, isn't it? All right, let's, I'm just going to take my hand off the material and try to move across now that we have the lighting situation better off. Absolutely lovely stitching. I'm bumping the machine right now. Hold on a second. I got to pull it out. Folks, it doesn't get any better than that. That is lovely. Well, no, that's that's the wrong thing to say. Scott, you have to stay after class now. We could make it even better. We can always make it better. But those are some gorgeous, gorgeous stitches, that top stitch. Let's flip it over and see what we got for our lock stitch. Oh, I got it dirty over there. That's kind of weird. All right, let's look at our lock stitch now. This is our lock stitch. And again, I'm holding this camera, so, you know, be patient with me as I try to get it aligned correctly and as the camera tries to focus on that stitching. And here's what, here's, here's my point. It's kind of interesting. Look right there in the shot that I have. You see a little bit of puckering just a tiny little bit of puckering on that 100% cotton that could have been avoided if we had backed off that presser foot pressure just a little bit. So initially from the top, it looked like we, we dodged the bullet. You know what I mean? We dodged the bullet from the top of the material. But when you get to the bottom of the material, you can see here as it's going over the feed dogs and underneath that presser foot. Oh, there I am. As it's going uh, over the feed dogs and underneath the presser foot, we got a little bit of puckering, a little bit of bunching right there. See that? So we did not dodge the bullet. We knew, I knew what I should have done. I should have backed off that presser foot pressure just a little bit, and I didn't. And the machine managed it really well, but it still uh, got a little bit of puckering out of it. Just very subtle puckering. Right there, especially, you can see that puckering right there. And if you get that on your materials when you're sewing, that puckering 99.9% .9 of the time, kind of like the, the hand sanitizer, 99.9% uh, .9 of the time is going to be a feed factor. It's going to be that your presser foot pressure is a little bit too heavy for that. There it is. Your presser foot pressure is going to be a little bit too heavy 
for that lighter material. So you'll back it off. But those are gorgeous stitches. Don't you agree? That's our lock stitch again, where we got a little bit of puckering on the bottom and our top stitch. So a great outcome, I'm going to turn my light back on now, um, a great outcome so far in, again, our setup, our setup is really more for leather than it is for anything else. And yet we've sewn Kona cotton, we've sewn denim, we've sewn, uh, what else have we sewn? Most of the other stuff is leather. So, but the machine is doing an excellent job of managing this, even though we don't have the ideal setup. So all of that blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. So. Um, do you back off? Oh, bye, Terry. Um, Lisa, Lisa wrote, oh, that's the owner. Oh, my gosh. I didn't know the owner was in the, the live stream, you guys. That's Lisa is the owner of this 99K and already has a 201 that I sent to her. So the way you adjust presser foot pressure, again, if I understood Lisa's question correctly, is right up here. This little knob right here, if you turn it clockwise, it's going to increase presser foot pressure for heavier materials. If you turn it counterclockwise it's going to decrease the pressure down on that presser foot and it's going to allow more delicate materials like the Kona cotton that we just sewed this stuff over here. It's going to allow us to sew materials lighter like this uh, without getting that puckering factor that we got uh, because of that higher presser foot pressure. So that's horrible lighting. Wait a second. There we go. So, you know, again, as you look at the material, if you're looking at the top of the material, if you're looking at the top of the material, it looks fine. There's, there's not really any puckering per se, but it's when you turn it over and you look at the bottom of the material where you can see the evidence, there's a little bit of puckering, a little bit of uh, bunching right there because that presser foot was pushing down too hard for this lightweight uh, Kona cotton. And yet this 99K still did a brilliant job of managing and maintaining stitch quality, even though there was a little bit of bunching going on right in that region right there on the backside of the Kona cotton. So, you know what? If a machine is running at the top of its game, it, it gives you a lot of forgiveness when you're working with different uh, challenges and obstacles like this, and it will give you great uh, stitch outcomes. Let me look at uh, the comments again. Hold on a second. Oh, you're, you're welcome, Lisa. You're very welcome. You know, and it's one of those things. I've had extremely experienced uh, seamstresses uh, that have contacted me with those bunching issues and they they were very smart sewers. They knew they knew their machine. They'd used their machine forever, but they were changing material types. All of a sudden, they're getting a bunching issue, and a lot of them had never ever ever adjusted presser foot pressure. Didn't even understand what it was. You know the fact that it's going to be compressing that spring. There's a spring inside of this faceplate, and as you turn turn this little uh, presser foot adjuster clockwise. It's pushing harder down on that spring and increasing the pressure of that presser foot against whatever material. And, and the thing you have to remember, too, is as you're increasing that pressure on this presser foot bar and it's pushing down against that material, it's also driving that material harder into the feed dogs. So that's great if you've got material that is much thicker, you have multiple layers, because then those feed dogs are going to be pushing into that material and working with that presser foot to get that material to feed evenly. But if you have uh, a real delicate or lighter material, it can create a lot of havoc as far as bunching uh, and create, 
you know, what we got without that adjustment with that cone of cotton is really quite amazing. Uh, it was very, very minimal, very minimal bunching compared to what we could have had, to say the least. So, all right, what should we do next? And I want to be mindful of the time as well. I'll, I'll give you guys as much time as you want. And especially with the owner present, uh, I don't want to cut any corners for the owner. Uh, so, I mean, we've got a lot of things we could still sow. I'll show you again just to kind of revisit it. And if the owner wants to pick something, that would be super cool. Uh, we already did canvas. I'm going to throw that to the side. Uh, we've got this bubble gum material, which has a high vinyl concentration in it to it. This is tricky stuff to sew. So that, that would be something fun to sew. We've got commercial upholstery material. And then on the leather side, we've got, uh, whoops, I almost dropped it. We've got, we've got protected full grain leather. We've got uh, uh, genuine elk hide, which we've already sewn. We've got this right here. It's weird. I had, I had to sniff it to see what it was. This is a type of cowhide, this white stuff. We've got saddle grade leather right there. And then we've got, I think we've already sewn this too. This is, yeah, we did this. This is Italian leather. So I'm going to throw that out of the way as well. And then last but not least, we have a type of protected full grain leather on the bottom here. So we haven't done any protected full grain leather yet, but I'll leave it up to the uh, owner to decide. I just, I remember I talked about the 99, you need to level it out. I just got lazy and I kind of was leaning on the machine and you saw the machine start to tip a little bit like, hey. So, and I can certainly, if Lisa doesn't have um, pads like this, I don't know if she's planning on putting this 99K into a table or into um, maybe a base or something, but you can let me know that, Lisa. And if you don't have a plan right now as far as, uh, a table or a base, I can send these furniture pads with the machine. And that way you'll have a way to level it out. You'll have to put one here and then one on the back as well by the other foot. You can see where the two feet are right there. And that levels the machine out. And then what I do is I put a little non-skid thing right here, like I showed you before, underneath this, because this is going to be agitating as it's moving and driving that raceway. And you don't want this to start sliding or skipping uh, either underneath there. So, all right. So what should we, let me see, let me look. Oh, we got another. Okay, I'll send the pads with it then, Lisa, no problem. Um, <laughs> we have another new new person as well, to my eyes anyway. Uh, and I hope I don't say it wrong. It's either Lena or Lena, maybe Lena. Welcome to Lena as well. So, and I don't see that. Um, okay. See you later, Kevin and Doreen. Hope you guys are staying safe and having uh, continued good weather out in Iowa. Um, okay. So I don't see that anybody typed the material. So I will do some, <clears throat> excuse me. I'll do some bubble gum material. And then as a last sew off, if that's okay, I'll do this protected full grain leather and we'll do it to the same song that we started with, which is the 1812 Overture. Great piece of music. And then we'll wrap this uh, live stream up because believe it or not, you guys, we've been going like two hours and 30 minutes and I'm cool with that. But at the same time, I, I want to respect your time as well. So this is way too big. Let me cut this down a little bit. Hold on a sec. I just refreshed the screen, so hopefully our music will play without stopping. May have cut that too short. But that would be fun to try to sew. See how narrow I made that? We'll sew that really narrow. And we'll sew it back to back so we can see the stitching more clearly. And then our last sew off again will be this protected full grain leather. 
and we'll do that to the 1812 overture. I, ho I hope that it plays. Otherwise, we'll be sewing and humming without the 1812 overture. So. Yeah, just a second, guys. All right, a little bit of music. Holy mackerel! Jiminy Crickets, we're rocking! This is insane! We're going to be sewing bubblegum material to like rap music here. This I don't know that this has ever been done. Of course, if it stops playing, then it won't matter, right? It's not going to matter. There we go. All right, this will be fun. This will be just fun to see if I can hold this on course. Because it's very, very narrow. Very, very narrow. Hold on a second. Let's get real close. All right, here we go. That actually went better than I thought it would. <laughs> Do you have any idea how much self-control it has it takes right now not to be dancing? This is totally dancing music. Yikos. Yikos, Tycos. All right, let's take a look at this stitching. All right, I'm trying to remember. I had it like this. So this is our top stitch. Let's look at our top stitch first. Once this, the camera decides it's going to focus. Yes. Good job. All right. Let's try it like this. See if it's happier this way. turn it around it's kind of catching a little bit all right the heck with it i'm gonna i'm gonna lay it down and try to do it that way because it is not cooperating right now as far as focusing let's try it this way all right this again is going to be our top stitch we're going to try to look at first if the camera uh behaves There we go. There we go. Maybe I need to clean this camera off on the lens or something. Maybe it got dirty from all the work I've been doing down here.
finally, after all of that battle, I finally got it where you could actually see the stitching. It's gorgeous stitching, folks. Gorgeous, gorgeous stitching. And again, this bubblegum material has a real high level of vinyl in it, and it can easily cause skip stitching, distorted stitching, and uh, just all kinds of havoc. And uh, Lisa's uh, 1954 99K just did a brilliant job of managing it. I mean, that's gorgeous stitching. All right, now let's turn it over and look at the lock stitching and see if we can also brag about that as well. Let me kind of tilt it up a little bit. I'll kind of bring it out as well. Folks, that also is absolutely bragworthy stitching. And again, the lock stitch is always a more difficult thing for the machine uh, to generate. Always more difficult. And Lisa's uh, 99K had no trouble managing it uh, whatsoever. And again, our setup is not absolutely ideal. We're working with a leather needle. And that, that complicates things a little bit, but the machine overcomes those issues because it's so it's so happy. It's a happy machine. So there we have our lock stitch again, absolutely spot on. Our top stitch, absolutely spot on. I always like looking at stitches from the side too. They're just kind of, you really can see the beauty of the stitch when you kind of see it from the edge too. It's a gorgeous stitch. All right, let's let's do this. Let's put it back in our pile of all the other sew-offs that we've done on Lisa's machine. And now we're going to do our final sew-off. Um, and I'm going to get this material in position. We're going to try to end the, the live stream the same way we started it. Good gravy. The same way we started it almost two hours and 40 minutes ago, y'all. Almost two hours and 40 minutes ago. Wow. Holy mackerel. But that's okay. That's okay. We have fun. We have fun and we learn together and we make new friendships. So it's all good. It's all good. All right. Let's get that into position. Do a little bit wider shot because we're going to be kind of buzzing around. And you know what? I just realized I can't get that camera too close as I'm rotating the material. I'm going to end up knocking it over, knocking the camera over. So we'll do it from this distance right here. I think that's pretty good. There we go. That's a good shot, I think. <clears throat> okay. So let me, this, this again is our final sew off. Let me cue up the 1812 overture. And hopefully the music continues to play. If it doesn't continue to play, I'm just going to mess around and just sew around a little bit more. And, uh, and then we'll wrap this up, okay? Let's see here. Oh, goodness. I didn't know you had featherweights too, Lisa. Very cool. Very, very cool. I know Emma's got a bunch of machines too, so you ladies are going to start chatting about all your machines, and that'll be, that'll be fun. All right, let me get the music cued, and we'll wrap up this live stream with the 1812 Overture, where I'm going to be buzzing all over the place, showing the uh, the ability of this machine to navigate, maintain stitch quality. And again, what we're sewing on here is protected full grain leather. So this leather, you can't see it, but it has a coating on it to protect it from staining and to protect it from, uh, you know, excess wear, etc. So it's not just leather, it's also fortified leather, leather as well, which is kind of cool. All right. Let me find that song. Hold on. <laughs> 
1812 Overture, I love this song. I hope it plays, I hope it plays, keep playing. Well, thank you again to everybody and welcome, especially to the uh, the owner, uh, Lisa from the beautiful Washington state and all the new people. All right, I better get ready, I better get ready. gosh look what we created isn't that a hoot look at that and it's not just a way to waste thread it's just a we almost created like a i don't even know what that thing is called where you have the different things and you draw the lines and everything but that is really really neat and look at the way that lisa's machine managed that we've got consistent stitch quality throughout now here's the big deal how did the machine do at that speed, I'm rotating, I'm pulling, I'm flexing the needle as I'm maneuvering that protected full grain leather, generating all of this stuff, all of this cool stuff. And how did it do in maintaining stitch balance on the lock? Absolutely perfect. Look at that. 
page 34 stitching every single stitch is exactly as it should be exactly and the most important thing is the music didn't stop so i was able to play for that much longer but that's a gorgeous and i'll send i always send all of these to the owner so lisa will be able to look at these uh herself and be able to see the beauty of that stitching up close and personal uh as she's holding it in her own hand so and i did the same thing with her 201 as well but just absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous stitching. Uh, lock stitch, which you can kind of see better actually from a distance, it looks like. And then also the top stitch as well. This is a great machine. If Lisa already said she has two featherweights, this is going to give her a brand new appreciation for a mighty might compact type machine that's going to have a lot more punch than her featherweights do. And it even, because of the 0.7 amp motor on this 99K, it even has more punch than her 201-2 that I already sent to her. But yeah, okay, granted, 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 you guys are you guys are too smart for me to slide one like, in, like that in and to have you just accept it at face value. Yes, the 201-2 has direct drive, gear-to-gear -gear power. And this one is belt-driven. So it's kind of a trade-off, isn't it? But you saw how fast I was sewing. You saw me manipulating that leather. And we didn't lose stitch quality once with the top stitch or the lock stitch. So this is an amazing machine. I'm so excited for Lisa. And I'm just going to real quick capstone the uh, sew-offs that we did live on this live stream today. You want, to, you want to see something crazy with all that sewing we did. Let me just show you real quick. This machine obviously has a class 66 bobbin. This, this 99K uses the same. Where am I? This, <laughs> this 99K uses the same bobbin that Lisa's 201-2 does. So she can exchange the bobbins back and forth. But I'm going to be giving her a goodie box with this machine as well. That not only has extra class 66 bobbins, but it's also got some fun attachments as well. And beyond that, because I want her, she's got featherweights. She's got uh, the 201-2. Now she's going to have this 99K. None of those machines are, are, are set up from inception with the idea of doing a zigzag. So I'm also going to give Lisa this fun original singer adjustable zigzag attachment that she'll be able to use this on her featherweight. Where am I? I'm, I'm not even aiming the camera in the right spot. What the heck? Uh, she'll be able to use this attachment, uh, this zigzag attachment on her featherweight. She'll be able to use it on her 201-2. She'll be able to use it also on this 99K. And it's going to take her straight stitch only machines to a point where they can do zigzagging as well. That's kind of fun, isn't it? Yeah. So this is what I do for my customers. Lisa reached out and uh, ended up getting two machines for me. So I want to give her a little bit of extra toys and fun to enjoy and that she can use with all of her machines, the zigzagger, all of these attachments, the extra bobbins, and then she can go through all of these sew-offs. Oh, uh, did I show you? Look at all the thread we still have left on this Class 66 bobbin. See that? Class 66 bobbins, they don't hold quite as much as a Class 15 bobbin, but they do a brilliant job. So, again, look at this. On the live stream, we did this to the 1812 Overture. Just as we did, let me kind of dig it out of there. We did this one to the 1812 Overture as well. Protected full grain leather, saddle grade leather on top. Hold on a second. Turn my little light on. There we go. We did this Kona cotton, 100% cotton. We did this uh, genuine elk hide on camera and off camera, generating absolutely uh, drop dead gorgeous uh, stitches. Then we also did this Italian leather, again, generating absolutely drop dead gorgeous stitching as well. 
you do it like this. I think I get a little bit better lighting in that way. And then off camera, I did this protected full grain leather as I was adjusting the machine, did this extra elk hide off camera. Then we did this 100% cotton with this stiffener on this live stream today. As we did this canvas, as we did this, these six layers, I think it was, of heavy grade, six layers of heavy grade denim. We did that on this live stream as well today. And then last but not least, this bubblegum material. So our sew-off sandwich for Lisa's 99K, both on camera and off camera, is this. This is what the real deal looks like when you're really testing a machine so that when I mail that, when I pack this up very carefully, which the packing process alone for a machine like this going all the way out to Washington state is going to take me about two to three hours. But you know what? Who cares? I want this machine to arrive safely to Lisa and she'll get all of these sew offs with it. She'll get this cool adjustable zigzag attachment that will work with all of her machines, including her featherweights. And then this extra singer box with these extra attachments and bobbins as well. So if you're looking for a machine and you say, can I get a total package like that? Yeah, yeah, just reach out. We'll find the right machine and uh, you'll have a lot of fun. Plus we'll have a lot of fun at the live stream as well, won't we? I love live streams and I love being able to showcase a machine like this so that everyone else out there in the world that has a 99K will look at Lisa's and say, I hate you. I hate you because your machine did all of this. And I tried lighter leather on my 99K and the puppy choked. It choked because it couldn't handle it. So Lisa's going to have a blast with this machine. You guys enjoy uh, chatting a little bit more, making some new friendships. And I will leave the live stream on for a little bit. I'll, I'll see if I can play a little bit more music and then I'll end this live stream. But again, remember you can continue chatting after, after the live stream, after the live stream ends and, uh, and then make some new friendships. Okay, cool. All right. Awesome. Thanks again, Lisa, for the opportunity of preparing, uh, both of these machines for you the 201-2 and this awesome 99K. Yeah, cool. All right, I'm gonna set the camera down and we'll find a little bit more music. And yes, it's actually, it's actually me. It wasn't just somebody like pretending my voice and yeah, you get the idea. All right, guys, take care. Thanks again for joining this. And thanks to all of those that stepped out and joined the chat as well. Very cool. Very, very cool. Ooh, there's also a, is that Carla? I think there's a Carla. Oh, and Mindy. Hi, Mindy. I think I said hello to Mindy, but if I didn't say hello to Mindy, I just said hello to Mindy now. Yeah. All right, let me back this up because I'm going to kind of set the camera in front of here. And also congratulations to Lisa uh, because she recently retired. I didn't know what she did, uh, but she retired and now she can enjoy even more fun with her sewing machines, which is really awesome. I'm trying to get the right angle. You guys bear with me for a second here. Oh, there we go. There we got it. Ah, ha, ha. There's the right angle. There's that beautiful... 99k that belongs to lisa from the great state of washington washington all right let's put some jamming music on here a little bit of a celebration as we wrap this up hold on wait for it wait for it almost there <laughs> yeah oh this is i could totally use this for sewing in a circle
didn't I? Listen to this music. This is awesome. Hey, welcome, Emmy. What a neat name, Emmy. Oh, and there, there the music ended. Bummer. All right. Well, you guys take care. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. And uh, again, the chat will be live for a while after I end the live stream. So uh, God bless you guys. Watch out for other um, live streams and premieres like this. And please remember, please, 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 please remember to check out the contest and giveaway that I have going on right now that's going to be running until the 31st of March. Uh, all the stuff is ex is explained in the video on this channel, and it's also explained on Facebook as well. You can win a very cool Singer 170th edition, limited edition, I should say, uh, Class 15 machine. I got all the pictures up on Facebook. I show it in the video, and all you have to do is write a simple little essay about a fictitious town and it's called Calico. Matter of fact, I'll show you. This is Calico over here. So check that out. I, I would love to get a lot of entries. The leaders and I are going to read these uh, great creative pieces and then pick a winner to get that awesome 170th uh, limited edition uh, sewing machine that I'm giving away. And the there's going to be a second runner-up and a third runner-up as well that's also going to get some cool prizes. So we'll actually have three winners for this contest uh, on this cool little town called Calico. So check it out, would you guys? Let's get a lot of great entries, please, please, please. All right, back to the real focus, this beautiful 99K. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I can't get the music to play, so maybe I'll, maybe I'll do something else for a few seconds here. That's the best. Yeah. Too much spit and not enough air. It's pretty much life, isn't it? We always have too much spit and not enough air. All right, I'm going to end the live stream. Uh, God bless you guys again. And watch for other great machines like this where folks, they, they step out of the shadows and they say, I could get a machine anywhere, but it's coming from the workshop. And thank you again to Lisa, the owner, for making that decision. And congratulations again on your retirement. And yeah, that's it. All right, I'm going to end the live stream. You guys chat if you'd like. Cool. See ya.